from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. A wonderful welcome to what appears to be, or going to be, a very wonderful program. I'm Chris Murphy. I'm the head of the Near East section here in the Library of Congress. Uh, that section is in the African Middle Eastern Division. And uh, our division has partnered uh, with uh, the Roshan Institute and Center at the uh, University of Maryland, and uh, with Mr. Kevin Schwartz, who is uh, associated with the University of Maryland and has been working a great deal in our reading room on Persian materials uh, and brought us together to have this program. This morning's uh, portion will take part here and then tomorrow there will be more sessions at the University of Maryland. Uh, so with that again I want to say welcome to you. I hope you enjoy what you're going to hear today. And now I'd ask uh, Fatima Keshavars to please come up and say something. Thank you very much. Um, um, I would like to join Chris to welcome you all here this morning. Um, I'm sure we are all looking forward to two days of invigorating discussion and uh, lovely presentations. Um, again, I, I think that there will be a tour for you to see the exhibit um, I, I, as I, you know, in, in a program, so hopefully you will all get to go there. And I would like to also uh, thank Hirad and Chris and Mary Jane, our partners in the library that made the exhibit possible and the lecture series, which is also funded by the uh, Roshan Cultural Heritage Institute. Um, and Dr. Mirjal Ali, in particular, made a personal gift to make that um, happen. And we do have really a wonderful group of speakers. Last week, we had an amazing presentation, very elegant, by Dr. Hakok on um, the Shah Nameh. It was really a, a, a wonderful combination of scholarship and thought and elegance, and we really enjoyed it and looking forward to more. Um, we have also tried there to keep our discussions of Persian and Persian books open to not, what, not only what is today within the borders of the nationally defined Iran, but to the constellation of cultures that have been uh, speaking Persian and carrying these cultures within themselves and nurturing them. And uh, we can learn about them and from them uh, all and uh, I, I very often think that uh, we now have reached a point with great scholars, you know, um, Lazansky, Rajiv here, um, people who have done work on the literature, at least, side that I know more about, and to um, really learn about these different wonderful constellations of cultures uh, we sometimes just dismiss as, you know, satellites of another culture, and I don't think that is any longer a viable position for any of us. So um, with that, I would really like to thank Kevin, our SSRC fellow, who partnered with us with the Roshan Institute since last year when he was applying for the grant and while at the same time working on personal scholarship and has been fearlessly organizing this, <laughs> this uh, conference and bringing all of you together. And again, I, I wish you a wonderful conference and thank you so much, Kevin. He has more things to say, I'm sure, that yeah, we can all listen to. Thanks. Yes, please. Well, thank you, Dr. Keshavars and Chris. I'll be really brief here. Um, I am a social science research council postdoctoral fellow for transregional research, bit of a mouthful, and I'm hosted by the Roshan Institute for Persian Studies at Maryland, and it's in that capacity as a postdoctoral fellow, and through their generous financial contributions that I've been able to bring you here 
together. So I just wanted to speak briefly about that innovative fellowship of which I'm a part and to give you a sense of the background of this conference and where it came apart. So the purpose of the SSRC Transregional Fellowship is to support transregional research under the rubric of inter-Asian context and connections. Its purpose is to strengthen the understanding of issues and geographies that do not fit neatly into existing divisions of academia or the world and to develop new approaches, practices, and opportunities in international, regional, and area studies in the United States. The intellectual thrust of the project is the reconceptualization of Asia as an interlinked historical and geographic formation stretching from the Middle East through Eurasia, Central Asia, and South Asia to Southeast Asia and East Asia. So it's with that kind of background and framing in mind that I decided to convene this conference, the Wide World of Persian Connections and Contestations, that I thought could explore the diverse features of Persian literary, cultural, political, social, and religious norms, both historically and today, features that connect various peoples and places across this wide geography we call the Persian sphere, the Persian world, or the Persian speaking world. So that's all I really wanted to say, just give due deference to the sponsors. And with that, I just want to thank Dr. Keshavars, Nurushan Institute, Ahmed Kar Mustafa, Ahmed Krimir Kak, Nazanin Behran Band, who were instrumental from that end in making this event happen. And at the Library of Congress, the African and Middle Eastern Reading Room, uh, Chris Murphy, Mary Jane Deeb, who couldn't be here, and the tireless efforts, as always, of Hirad Dinavari, who, again, instrumental in making this happen. And then finally, thank you for the speakers for coming from near and far. So I think we have a great program for the next two days. And with that, I'll ask our speakers of the first panel, Muriel Atkin, Amin Tarzi, and Wajma Osman, if they could join Chris Murphy up here. And he will introduce our first panel. Thank you. The first panel today um, is focusing on identity and politics, uh, and it will uh, consist of three presentations by Amin Tarzi, Muriel Atkin, and Varjma Usman. Um, before, before each of the individuals makes their presentation, I will give a very brief uh, introduction for them. Uh, we have approximately an hour and a half, so each of the uh, presenters will have 25 minutes, and we should then hopefully have 10 or 15 minutes for questions. And uh, let me uh, remind you that th this uh, panel and the other panels are being videotaped for later uh, broadcast. And um, if and we want you to ask questions. But if you choose to ask a question, uh, that gives uh, an implied consent that uh, not only may we uh, use your image and your voice, uh, but that we may use it to put up on the web. Um, so that's just a, a piece of, of, of bureaucratic uh, um, you know, wording that needs to be said and so that, that you know, six months when this is up and you see yourself, uh, you will have been forewarned. Um, okay, our first uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Amin Terzi, who teaches at the Marine Corps University at Quantico. Um, his uh, uh, presentation is entitled Status and Politics of Persian Language in Afghanistan, a Brief Review. Uh, Professor Tarzi, uh, earned his PhD and uh, MA degrees at the Department of Middle Eastern Studies at New York University. Uh, he is the director of the Middle East Studies program at the Marine Corps University. His latest works are about the Taliban and the crisis in Afghanistan, co -edited, a co-edited volume with Professor Robert D. Cruz of Stanford. And I might mention that uh, young Professor Cruz uh, did a postdoc at the Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress, which I will also put in a plug. If any of you have finished your PhD in the last uh, seven years uh, and you think that there's collections here that can help you, apply for a Kluge Fellowship. Uh, if you're a senior scholar, like a, the three here in the front, um, and you're interested, 
let us know and we will send your name up to the librarian. But the librarian of Congress has sole responsibility and keeps it solely within his purview to select. Um, but he has selected some very interesting people. So uh, yeah, it's been uh, a very nice thing. Anyway, so uh, Professor Terzi uh, has this book with uh, Professor Cruz and also a piece called The Iranian Puzzle Piece, Understanding Iran in the Global Context. Uh, without further ado, I'd ask Professor Terzi to... Good morning. Uh, I also like to thank the Roshan Institute, uh, and specifically I want to thank Kevin Schwartz. Uh, I'm here because of him. Uh, he found me. I'm very glad to have been found. Uh, and before I say anything else, whatever I say, whatever you record, these are words of Amin Tarzi and not of the Defense Department nor of any other government agency of the United States of America. I do work for the Defense Department, I have to say that. Uh, I, I work on security issues, mainly Iranian and the Arab Gulf security issues. Uh, I look forward, not backwards, meaning I work on things that are strategic. So it is very much a pleasure for me to work on something that I actually studied and something that I have a lot of passion in, but I don't get a chance to work on. So Kevin, thank you very much for that. I'll read you a little statement from the newsletter for, of the Association of, for the Study of the Persian Age Societies. Number eight, April 2002, I have it right here. This is a quote. Our projects for institutional development continued with projects for opening offices in Poland and Armenia, with Georgia and Azerbaijan to follow. With the end of civil war and change of regime in Afghanistan, we can finally extend our activities to that very Persianite society. Dr. Amin Tazi, that's me, of the Monterey Institute of International Studies has agreed to chair an ad hoc committee for opening an office in Kabul. And Dr. Joanne Gross has agreed to serve on it. I'll end right there. That was 2002. We still do not have an office in Kabul. I tried, that was not possible. Joanne Gross, has been trying ever since, not possible. I was, I don't know how many of you were there, but I was at Sarajevo last year, and uh, there was not single, not one scholar from Afghanistan, and the, where there is money actually, uh, so it wasn't an issue of financial, there is actually, within ASPS, there is uh, financial incentives for scholars uh, from countries of uh, developing countries that, that need the funds, not one. Let's start with that. Due to time constraints, I'll focus on five different periods of, Afghan of history of Afghanistan and will focus on the status of Persian language therein. I'm planning on spending more time on the earlier periods and would only outline main points in the more recent times with the anticipation of discussing the issues missed in the Q&A. I'll give you a little bit of a structure, if I may, on the historical side, the new side that I said we can discuss it, and, and what is really happening, or at least what I believe is happening. Formation of the Afghan state, 1747-1893. The formation of Afghanistan as a distinct political entity beginning in 1747 effectively separated from each other some of the more important Persian-speaking heartlands that formed parts of civil empires beginning with the Achaemenids in the eight to four centuries before Christ to Nader Shah of Shah's reign, which ended in 1747. While splitting other areas such as Khorasan and Sistan and situating them under two distinct and contesting national entities of Afghanistan and Iran. In conventional Af Afghan historiography, Ahmad Shah Abdali, later known as Ahmad Shah Durrani, established the modern state of Afghanistan in 1747 in Kandahar. This historiography began through short references and publications during the reign of Amir Abdul Rahman, who was king from 1880 to 1901, and was formalized in the early 20th century with publication of the monumental Siraj al Tawarikh, written by Faiz Muhammad Khatib Hazara. By the way, those who do not read Persian, Robert McChesney, the person who I learned most of everything I know from, actually has translated and annotated it and has come out and seven volumes from Brill, and the next seven volumes are coming out. Both the person of Ahmad Shah and his exploits as a conqueror mainly in India, 
have formed the basis of both written and oral histories of Afghanistan have, and have shaped the very essence of that country as a domain in which the Pashtuns, especially Abdali Durrani's, have been regarded as the natural ruling class. What is absent in the historiography is the reference and the recognition of a manuscript called Tariqi Ahmad Shahi. The first official history of the political entity that became known as Afghanistan was written in Persian by Mahmoud al husseini al-Munshi bin Ibrahim al-Jami between 1754 and 1776. According to al husseini Ahmad Shah has assigned Muhammad Tahi Shirazi, an official from Nadir Shah of Shah's administration in Kandahar, then in the service of Ahmad Shah, to find him a historian with qualities matching those of the late Mirza Mahdi Khan Astar Abadi, the author of Tariq Nadir, Nadir Shahi, better known as Tariq Jahan Goshai Nadiri, to compose a similar history for him. During Ahmad Shah's siege and occupation of Mashhad in 1753-1754, Shirazi discovered an old acquaintance in the person of Mahmoud al husseini and introduces him as a potential court historian for the Durrani monarch. al husseini himself recounts that he had for some time chosen a reclusive life devoted to God and that he personally knew Astar Abadi. We have no indication whether he worked with Tariq and Adil Shahi, but they knew each other. al husseini most likely was born in Jam, east of Herat, and the only information uh, the author, uh, we have of the author of Tahir Hamad Shahi about if affiliation is that he was a Sayyid. We don't know whether he was a Shia or a Sunni. The history he wrote was not that of a geographical, a geographical area. Rather, his work is centered and chronicles the life and activities of Ahmad Shah Durrani, with most of the manuscript dedicated to the events after 1747. al Husseini prov provides that the main reason for his work is to memorialize Ahmad Shah's activities in Iran, Turkestan, India, and other territories within his domain and his battles and conquests. In the entire manuscripts, al husseini never mentions the term Afghanistan. The debate as to when and how the term Afghanistan came to be applied to the domain carved out of the collapsing Safavid Empire, feuding centers of power in India, and the fragile Turkic Khanates by Ahmad Shah Durrani remains unresolved. Both Afghan and non-Afghan writers of conventional Afghan historiography agree that Ahmad Shah established a distinct political entity called Afghanistan. Faiz Muhammad Khatib, I'll come to him later, perhaps best reflects the gradual, if not unintentional, naming of the new political entity that began to take form in 1747. He described it as, in, as including the regions which after the introduction of Islam were known as Khorasan, extended from Herat to to Kandahar and Kabul, and the la land of Roh, namely the mountainous regions to the east of the Indus River, extending as far as Hassan Abdal, which is now in modern-day Pakistan. He writes that in 1747, the area, and I quote, came to be more often designated Afghanistan. The simplest way to explain this is that in the view of the large number of Afghans who live in this territory, the suffix Stan, is added to the word Afghan, hence the name Afghanistan. One thing I want to point here, most of you know here, the, when I say Afghan here, until the end of this paper, I mean Pashtun. They are absolutely synonymous. Afghan here does not mean everybody else. It only means the Pashtuns. And until, basically until 1964, the term Afghan or Afghani, the word Pash the language of Pashto was actually known as Afghani until 1964 and written and the people are Afghan. When you say Afghan, it's only designated the Pashtuns and not the rest of them. For al husseini the, the dominion of Ahmad Shah did not have a specific name. Rather, it included the territories of Iran represented by Eastern Khorasan, the Indian territories represented by what Khatib ref refers as to Roh, and the Turkestan territories south of the Amu River, represented by the mainly Uzbek Khanids, which Ahmad Shah incorporated into his domain. While modern Afghan historiography tends to designate a specific date for the formation of the entity with the label Afghanistan, in the word of Joss Gomez, such labels should be considered as fluid categories liable to fluctuations of historical process. The first historiography of what evolved into Afghanistan certainly attests to a fluid process. According to a treaty concluded in 17th 
1956, between Ahmad Shah and the Mughal Emperor Alamgir II, the Durrani king expanded his territorial claims and established his sovereignty over all former Mughal imperial holdings west of the Indus River and over Lahore, Multan, Kashmir, Sarhan, and Gujarat. One of the justifications for Ahmad Shah, including the aforementioned territory into his God-given state, davlat i khudadat was that they were part of Nadir Shah of Shah's domain and as a result of the conquest of India. Another justification for the Durrani takeover of these territories, as mentioned by al was the weakening of the Gurgani or Mughal state from the infidel encroachments and internal political dissent. While Afghanistan's first history is written entirely in Persian, based on Nadir Shah of Shah's history, the purpose of Ahmad Shah Durrani was to emulate his former master, but not to rule over a province of what was formerly constituted of Safavid Empire. And I want to make this point clear. It is in Persian, it is written as a continuation of Nadir Shah of Shah's history, but Ahmad Shah Durrani is not looking to become a part of a collapsing Safavid state. Rather, he was keen on laying down the foundations of a future Afghan slash Pashtun dominated political entity. However, neither Ahmad Shah nor his successors almost for two centuries on regarded the prominence of the Persian language in their, in their domain as a problematic. So this is my first postulate. While Ahmad Shah created a country specifically for Afghan, i.e. Pashtuns, he did not have a problem with Persian being its language. He wrote poems, actually his poem books that are, are available, beautiful poems in Pashto. So he was very fluent, he was Kandahari, he's a Durrani. However, he chose, he actually went after finding a historian that was similar to Asar Abadi, who had by that time died, to, to have a history written in Persian, he had no problems. He, he did all his communications, even with foreign countries, which in, uh, right now in the Afghan archives, are all in Persian. There's not a single word in Pashto, even though he was fluent. All correspondence within the emerging Afghan state, both internal and external, was ex ex conducted exclusively in Persian. Publication began to take root in Afghanistan in the 1860s with the first, albeit short, newspaper, Shamsun Nahar, which was entirely in Persian. Amir Sher Ali Khan, uh, he reigned from 1869 to 1979, tried to promote Pashto, especially as the language of the newly organized military but the state administration and the few pamphlets that were published during his reign were all in Persian. Books and pam pamphlets published in the 1860s to the late 1880s were predominantly in Persian. Abdurrahman had a number, less than 10 I would say, of his treatises published in both Persian and Afghani, the term commonly used for Pashto. I have designated 1893 as the date when Afghan nation state as perceived by the country's emir was formed within a defined international boundary and with one central government with, in full control of the provinces. After crushing all of the opposition to his rule or to centralization of power and forcefully converting the last non-Muslim non areas within his domain, Abdurrahman ass assumed the new title of Zia o Millati Waddin and announced the Jashni Muttafiqai Milli and published a treatise recounting his accomplishment in both Persian and Afghani languages. Second phase, the budding of Afghan nationalism, 1893-1929. Ironically, the beginning of the Afghan Pashtun nationalism coincided with Abdurrahman's signing of an agreement with Sir Matumar Duran, Foreign Secretary of the British Raj in 1893, establishing the boundary of Afghanistan and British India and thus separating the Pashtun and Pashto-speaking population in half between the two political entities. The boundary settlements did allow the Amir to have a defined geographical space over which he can establish his direct rule with Sunni Islam rather than ethnicity as the main justification for unification and statehood. It was during Abdurrahman's son and successor, Amir Habibullah, 1901-1919, that Afghanistan's historical narrative began to be formalized. Habibullah's court historian, Faiz Muhammad Khatib, in the first page of Siraj al Tawarikh, writes that the Amir's own rationale for commissioning for this the work as such, and I quote, for the long time I have had in mind and deemed 
it necessarily write down the events and circumstances of Afghan rulers, beginning with His Highness Ahmad Shah Durrani and proceeding down to our own day. Afghanistan's constitutional movement, and I'm going very fast because of time, but we can discuss this. Afghanistan's constitutional movement in Siraj al Akbar. Amir Habibullah also established Habibiyah, the first public college of Afghanistan. This school was inaugurated in Kabul in 1904 and soon became the magnet of the few but increasingly impatient Afghan intellectual and political activities. Activists, sorry. The Amir employed the services of both local teachers as well as a number of visiting Indian Muslim and Ottoman teachers. The birth of the Afghan constitutional movement can be traced to this school and to the influence of some of these foreign teachers. In available Afghan sources, there is no information of the presence of Iranian teachers in Habibia, and thus would suggest that while the movement was developing in Iran at the same time, there was no established conduit of information between Iranian scholars and this school. What is known is that in 1906, a group of Habibia teachers sought and received the Amir's permission to publish a newspaper, Siraj al Akbar. For unknown reasons, the paper seeded publication after its first issue was printed. Thereafter, between 1907 and 1909, a secret group headed by Mawlawi Muhammad Sawar Wasif was formed to promote the idea of establishment of a constitutional monarchy in Afghanistan. Despite crushing the ideas of constitutional monarchy as well as a number of the members of the movement, the Amir allowed room and perhaps even encouraged the formation of a unique Afghan national identity through the rebirth of Siraj al-Akbar published in Persian under editorship of Mahmoud al-Tarzi from 1911 to 1918. While the issue of language was not central to Tarzi's nationalist agenda and the early issues of the newspaper, he referred to Persian as the official, rasmi, language of Afghanistan and ranked it only second to Arabic in importance and third after Arabic and Ottoman in usage within the Islamic world. He lamented that Persian, which was once spoken from the Ganges River to the east, Sir River to the north, and the Constantinople to the west, has now been reduced only to the countries of Iran and Afghanistan, a theme that is the title of Professor Amino Chair's paper this afternoon. However, while Tarzi wrote in Persian and recognized that language as the official language of his country, in his nationalistic quest, he referred to Afghani Pashto as Afghanistan's tribal and national, Qawmi wa Millati, and the official language of the aliens, whose origin, uh, or, or, original homeland, according to him, was the Hindu Kush mountains. Whereas the theme of the first Afghan constitutional mov movement is still debated among historians, the main message of the Afghan, young Afghan movement, a group that was around Tarzi, was, to promotion, was promotion of Afghan nationalism and progress towards creation of a modern unified Islamic state in Afghanistan with a secular government. Despite almost a total disconnect between concurrent Afghan and Iranian constitutional movements, the language of both remained Persian. However, while in Iran an attempt was made to incorporate Persian as the exclusive language of Iran in Afghanistan, there was a slow but steady policy of introducing Afghani Pashto as Afghanistan's exclusive or national, if not formal, official language. The dilemma of the Afghan authorities was manifold, including the dominance of Persian as Afghanistan's lingua franca and the only language that was understood by the majority of its diverse population. This association of the ruling elite with Pashto despite their Pashtun origins. Of the, of the Muhammad Zai kings, few of them spoke Pashto. Those who did, they did it as a second language very, very hard. When they spoke, you knew that it was not their, their first language. Then, overall dismal education system with very low literacy rates. And, as Gregorian has pointed out about, well, I, anyway, the Afghan elites fear that non-Pashtuns or non-Afghans would fear and feel alienated by a unified Afghanistan where Pashto was the main language because then they will feel that the Pashtuns are taken over. I'm kind of skipping the paper. Throughout Habibullah's reign, most of the publications were in Persian only. As noted above, the country's first master history was written in Persian by Hazara, which is interesting. The first history was written by a Herati, the second by a Hazara, and the third by a Tajik. All of the massive judicial texts of the Hanafi fiqh were only in Persian. The first book published in Afghani Pashto was in 1916 on the obedience to the ruler. 
1917, Lumlai Kitab, the Pashto, first Pashto book, was written by Salih Muhammad Kandahari as a guide for school teachers to teach Afghani to students. Both the introduction and instructions in this book are in Persian as a manner of teaching a foreign language to students. Kandahari, this introduction, praising the advancements achieved in Afghanistan in teaching this of sciences in Arabic, Persian, Turkish, Urdu, and English, and other languages, laments that if these subjects were taught in Afghani, the original Asli language of Afghanistan, Afghans, then students would be learning them much faster, and there would be no reason to learn a foreign language prior to engaging in scientific subjects, as if Persian was a foreign language. This is important here. Additionally, he decries that if the original language of a nation is forgotten, then the very identity of such a nation is wiped from the list of living nations. Therefore, according to Kandahari, Amir Habibullah in 1915 ordered the teaching of Afghani, the Qawmi wa Millati language of the Afghans in the Abibya school. Since Afghanistan, there exists no teaching material or grammar books in, Afgh in Afghani, and this teaching has been completely not existent. Therefore, this volume, the book I'm talking about, uh, in subsequent numbers would be published. Kandahari adds, at the end of this introduction, Kandahari lets the readers know that the, of all the Afghani dialects, the dialect of Kandahar has been chosen and selected as the one to teach all over Afghanistan because it is simpler, the sweetest, Shirin Tarin, and also used by the royal Durrani clan. I think that was the reason. The introduction of Afghani Pashto into the curriculum of Habibia during Habibullah reign cannot be recorded as an attempt to discount Persian in favor of Pashto, nor did it seem to have been a sound educational framework for teaching the language as evident from the very limited usage of Pashto in the cities where Pashtuns were not the majority and in formal governmental function, functions throughout the country. Afghanistan's independence. After the assassination of Amir Habibullah in 1919, one of his sons, Amanullah, became the Amir and embarked on a more radical, faster-paced, and pronounced progressive program, which included a brief border conflict with British, resulting in total independence of Afghanistan. Amanullah was an Afghan nationalist in the wider application of the term Afghan, which included all citizens of the country, not just Pashtuns. His nationalism, which was partly fueled by Mahmoud Tarzi, the former editor of Siraj al-Akhbar, the Amir's father-in-law and his foreign minister, was generally in the form of opposition to British colonialism and seeking closer ties with neighboring countries, including Iran and the newly formed Soviet Russia. Amanullah provided Afghanistan with its first constitution, which was adopted in 1923. The constitution caused much discord among the large landowners and conservative clergy and had to be amended and reissued. However, there was no noteworthy controversy over the absence of designation of an official language for the country. A Pashto version of the Constitution was printed, but the debates, some of which were printed for public release in the original version of the document, were all in Persian. Amanullah had tried to bring Pashto, albeit successfully, to the level of Persian, but the political fortunes of Pashto were to get a boost from the occurrences internal to Afghanistan okay, and beyond its borders. Emergence of Pashto-based nationalism, 1930-1946. After the ouster of Amanullah in 1929 and the short-lived Amirship of Amir, Amir Habibullah Kalakani, Muhammad Nader became the king mainly through support of conservative ulama, mostly from the Pashtun majority eastern Afghanistan. Mindful of Amanullah's relatively liberal policies and his social reform, which had brought about the fall, his fall through a rebellion fomented by mostly Pashtun tribal and religious leaders, the new king revised the constitution in 1931 and adopted, in Muhammad Hashem Kamali's word, a policy of rapprochement towards the eastern Pashtun tribes. While the new constitution did not explicitly recognize Pashto as the official language of Afghanistan, the ascendance of individuals in Nadir Shah's government who regarded Afghanistan as the homeland of true Afghans, i.e. Pashtuns, and the king's accommodation of the Pashtun nationalism had elevated the debate of the country's language policies to the highest levels of the state establishment. With the Nader's assassination in 1933, his young son, Muhammad Zahir, became king while effective power rested with Nader's brother, Muhammad Hashem, who served as prime minister and his nephew. I'll just give you a few points because of time. Under Hashem, 1933-46, one, 
rise of National Socialism in Germany. Hitler actually became uh, chancellor in the same year, 1933. With Afghan sympathizers with Nazis and their propaganda about the supremacy of the alien race and quest for Afghan na nationhood and national language. Two, Afghan government's desire to provide the country with its own language in order to consolidate ties with Pashtuns across the Indian-Afghan frontier. There's also this nationalism to reach back to what was cut off from 1893 onwards. Three, in the 1930s, Anjumani Adabi and Anjumani Tariq were established with an overall aim to project Afghanistan's history from prehistory to modern times to create a national history for Afghanistan. Four, in March 1937, royal proclamation to strengthen the Pashto language. All government workers were obligated to learn Pashto within three years. Five, according to Hashem in 1938, Pashto was to become, and I quote, the language of our officials doing away with Persian. Our legends and our poems will then be understood by everyone. We shall draw from, from that a pride in our culture of the past, which will unite us, end of quote. I don't think it's fully clear what, who Hashem was referring to as by us, but it seems to suggest that us were the Pashtuns only, not only to, in Afghanistan, but also across the boundary in Pakistan, oh, well, India at that time. There was also a suggestion to change the script of Pashto in even Persian and Afghanistan to Latin to differentiate it from Iran. So this was actually proposed not once, but three times. And six, establishment of Pashto Tolana or Pashto Academy in 1937, which was basically trying to promote Pashto into a level of Afghanistan's main language, but also it coincided with two other things. One, the inception of the Turkish Linguistic Society in 1932 with the aim of creating a purified national Turkish language and the establishment in 1935 of the Iranian Academy with its own nationalistic agenda of standardizing, standardizing and purifying the Farsi Persian. So these two, they were trying to, to push, push for that. I'm going to move away from the Pashtunistan type and uh, just briefly tell you, uh, without reading anything, in 1964, Afghanistan <coughs> had a constitution. For the first time, this constitution actually mentioned languages. It mentioned that among languages of Afghanistan, Pashto and Dari, and the name Dari came here, uh, were the languages of Afghanistan. And also this constitution was the most liberal Afghanistan had until the new one allowed for political parties. Some of these political parties were basically on language basis. You had parties such as Afghan Millat, uh, which was the National Socialist Party of Afghanistan, and the paper was called Afghan Millat, which was espousing Pashtunism. On the other side, you had a party called the Young Democrats. Their newspaper or weekly was called Sholay Jawed, which was pushing the Farsi or Pers Persian. And you had this new fighting, if you want, on, on language. And also there was a whole policy of anti-Pakistan and trying to incorporate Pashtunistan, which was, an, and for the Afghans, Pashtunistan is east of, west of Indus River. All the Pakistani territory west of Indus River. India was supporting it initially, but they dropped that support. Afghans, unfortunately, still continue that. And Two parties that came out there that were actually more powerful were the Islamists and the Marxists. And the Islamists and Marxists are the ones who really basically shaped Afghan's history until 2001. These two parties, represented by the PDPA, the uh, People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, and then the Islamists, the Mujahideen, if you would, they were not linguistically, they, they had more di different agendas. So language was not central to their aims. Actually, the communists, if I would, they became more liberal on languages, and the Islamists were speaking both Pashto and Persian. They were promoting Arabic, but they were not anti one or the other. In <clears throat> conclusion, I say that since the demise of the Taliban regime, which was ostensibly based on a merger of localized Islamic folklore, international Salafi Islamism, and Pashto nationalism, what you have today is a renewal of both understanding that Afghanistan is multilingual, the new constitution recognizes all languages of Afghanistan 
Pashto and Dali as official languages. The only uh, privilege Pashto gets in the Constitution that the national anthem should be in Pashto. However, what is happening today also uh, uh, is that there is a new fight going on. I call it the Danish Gapo Antun fight. In Afghanistan, if you go and it actually, ref if, how, you how you describe a, a institution of learning, a university in Afghanistan is very, very, very sensitive. So when I go to Afghanistan, I say university. I don't use either because I don't want to fall in any of those fights. And there is actually suggestions today by some people, and I'll discuss that more I will stop, as to make, make English the official language. I believe that the land where <coughs> Ferdowsi flourished and Onsuri and Sanai came in, and if you take Persian out of that, for me as an individual, that's a sad moment. And the fact that you don't have anybody from Afghanistan coming to these organizations, and I was unable, and Joanne Gross was unable to even open an office, tells you that there is a tension right now that is, in, under the surface, it is very, very, very destructive. It's unfortunately making Afghanistan go backwards, not forward. Uh, I thank you, and sorry to take more time, and thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Professor Terzi. Um, our next uh, presentation will be by Muriel Atkin of George Washington University. It's entitled, uh, Tajiks and the Persianate World. Uh, Professor Atkin uh, is at George Washington University. Um, she earned her doctorate at Yale. Um, she's now professor of history at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington. Uh, no, um, in the history department. In the history department, okay. So that's... Uh, I guess someone got that off, yep. offline. And that's evidently, yeah. because I was thinking, wasn't she in the history department? Yes. You are in the history department. Yes, okay, you're absolutely that's, right. <laughs> thank you for correcting that. Uh, professor Atkin has, you know, has a, a huge number of publications and uh, she has worked on many, many areas. Her research interests include, uh, among other things, uh, Russian policy towards Muslims at home, meaning both in the former Soviet Union and now Muslims in Russia, as well as Soviet Muslim relations, as in uh, Soviet, re Soviet, Soviet Muslim, Soviet Russian Muslim relations, meaning foreign relations, uh, and many other. Uh, with topics. So without any further ado, I would ask Professor Atkins to come up and... If you don't mind, I'd rather sit while I okay. do my best. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about what has happened over approximately the past century among the Persian speakers in Central Asia, north of the Amu Darya, in the area that became in the late 19th century the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union. You've already heard about issues of Persian language south of the Amu Darya. Uh, there, if you look back as to the early 20th century at the Tajiks living in the, Rus in the Russian Empire, uh, there was no such thing as what we recognize as modern nationalism among them, or even the precursors of modern nationalism among them. Sure, people knew what their mother tongue was, but it wasn't a key defining element. And even among people who were Persian speakers, identifying as a Persian speaker didn't necessarily mean what you might expect it to mean. You know, as you've heard, I'm a historian, and my job as a historian is always to say it is more complicated than it appears. And this is a, a prime example of much more complicated than it appears. If you would have asked someone, a Persian speaker in Russian world, Central Asia, in the early 20th century, how they identified themselves, one of the things they would surely have said was that they were Muslims. But this was, a, in many ways, a very vague and generic concept. And even though they would identify as Muslims, they were perfectly capable of saying that other groups of people who were Muslims, ah, but they're not good Muslims, so we don't really feel all that much in common with them. And also, among this group of Persian speakers, they were overwhelmingly uh, Sunni 
rather than she and of the Hanafi school, which was true <coughs> pardon, of um, most of the major ethnic groups of Russian rural Central Asia, not only the Tajiks. Uh, they would also identify as members of an extended family. Ideally, one should know one's family genealogy back at least seven generations, and that explains what sort of group of people you belong to. Uh, people would also identify in terms of the locale where they lived, a quarter of a city, a village, or a cluster of villages in a mountain valley. Now, in subsequent years, for reasons that I will get to in a moment, national and other kinds of identities were added on top of that, but the pre-existing kinds of identities never went away. So you've got layer upon layer of how people identify themselves, and often it depends on which particular context you're talking about uh, that will determine which kind of identity comes to the fore. And being true to my historical vocation, the situation is even more complicated than that. For many of the sedentary inhabitants of, the Central, A of Central Asia, including the Tajiks and the people who would nowadays be called Uzbeks, they wouldn't have been called Uzbeks then, but that's another story. Uh, they would have identified themselves as part of the settled in population of Central Asia. The term for that was Sat, and that was used more th as a designation than any kind of ethno-linguistic designation that we might expect nowadays. What is more, the Sunni Persian speakers of Central Asia did not feel, uh, in general, a strong affinity for the Shi Persian speakers of Iran. Uh, and in places like Bukhara and Samarkand, both of which had large Persian-speaking populations, there was strong opposition to attempts either by uh, the Safavi dynasty or Nader Shah Afshar to uh, take control of these parts of Central Asia. Uh, the Sunni-Shi difference was more important than the linguistic and border cultural similarities. And in fact, there was a separate term in use for Persian speakers in Central Asia who were Shi'i, and that term was Irani. You can tell where that comes from. from. Some of those people were merchants, but most of the people designated as Irani were the folks who had been enslaved, mostly by Turkmen slave raiders and then sold in the slave markets of Central Asia. So obviously there was a strong negative connotation to being perceived as either a slave or the descendant of slaves. And as a further complication, per the Persian language was also important to many of the speakers of Turkic languages of Central Asia, especially the Uzbeks. Parts of the government of the Emirate of Bukhara, which survived as a Russian vassal state after the Russian acquisition of the region, but parts of that government continued to use Persian as the language of administration. In the madrasas, uh, in addition to using Arabic as the language of instruction, also Persian and no Turkic language. It was Persian and Arabic exclusively. And uh, as a literary language, again, that continued to uh, predominate, even though there was some writing in Central Asian Turkic languages, but widespread use of Persian as a literary language. In some of the densely populated river valleys of the region, and especially in certain of the major cities, there was extensive interaction between the Persian speakers and the speakers of Turkic languages, again, especially those who would now be called Uzbeks. There was intermarriage, there was a high degree of bilingualism, there, uh, in those areas, the dialects of Persian speak, uh, uh, picked up Turkic influences, while what is now co called Uzbek picked up significant Persian influences, especially the loss of vowel harmony, which you find in most Turkic languages. Each group of Persian speakers and speakers of what would now be called Uzbeks, Uzbek had their own version of various epic poems that existed in oral tradition. 
And it was fairly common for educated people to write in both the languages, uh, Persian and Turki. If educated Persian speakers and what we would now call Uzbek speakers thought of in terms of belonging to a state that was larger than existing borders, they would have defined that, the territory that was their homeland as Turkestan, not as Bukharan, not as the Russian Empire, not as Greater Khorasan or whatever, but Turkestan. What changed all of this dramatically was uh, Soviet policy towards the region, uh, particularly from the mid-1920s forward. Uh, beginning in 1924, which was what, known, uh, what was known by the cumbersome Soviet bureaucratic term is the National Territorial Delimitation of Central Asia. Try saying that three times quickly. The, uh, the underlying premise of this really was not about Central Asia. This was about general Soviet nationalities policy, reflecting the fact that Lenin, looking at Eastern Europe, discovered that national identity was a more powerful factor than he had expected it to be and lasted longer than he had expected it to be. And so he decided he needed a policy for the Soviet Union as a whole that was going to try to defuse nationalism by giving it at least token recognition in these ethnically defined territorial units. Of course, all real power was vested in the Communist Party, which was highly centralized, but at least the form of ethnically defined republics was created. And so unlike many parts of the world where people debate how nationalism evolved, was it imagined communities or some other theory, this clearly was a matter of something that was imposed from outside and then people living in the region, whether they were Persian speakers or anybody else, had to figure out how would they navigate in that system in a way that could be advantageous to them and also cope with the constraints that were being imposed on them because you were allowed to have a national identity but only within the limits that the regime in Moscow permitted you to have, which was a significant constraint. And one of the things that happened for Persian speakers when this delimitation occurred, since especially, uh, first of all, uh, the two largest Persian speaking populations in urban areas in Bukhara and Samarkand were assigned to Uzbekistan. And Tajikistan began as an autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic, not a full fledged Union Republic, and it was part of Uzbekistan. So in, suddenly Tajiks found out that you can't think of Turkestan as your home. A, it doesn't exist. And B, in Uzbekistan, there were penalties for not being an Uzbek. Uh, employment opportunities, educational opportunities, being required to list your nationality in official documents. If you don't list your nationality as Uzbek, you pay a price for it in discrimination. Uh, There, um, that began to evolve over subsequent years in the Soviet era. So let me now talk about how the Tajik language and culture evolved in the Soviet period. There was the central concept of national and form socialist in content, meaning at least the outward structure of cultural institutions existed, but with careful regulation of the content to make sure it was politically acceptable to the Moscow government. Uh, so there would be libraries, universities, some schools that taught in Tajik, publications, newspapers, magazines, uh, publishing house, eventually radio, television, film studio. Uh, but there was also deliberate policy of manipulating the language. What would the written language look like? It was deliberately based on both the dialect as spoken in Bukhara with subsequent additions from 
other languages in more remote mountainous parts, but of northern Tajikistan. And that's significant because, among others, first of all, because it reflects manipulation in the content of the language. Secondly, because there's a major difference of dialect between northern and southern Tajikistan, which is divided by a mountain range. And the northern dialects have much more influence of what is now called Uzbek, as well as other linguistic influences. So there's a major divide between the north and the south. People in the south tend to say, we are much purer than the people in the north, but make of that what you wish. Uh, also, a deliberate policy of making the language different from what would be standard written Persian in Iran. Also, the inclusion of Russian loan words, not only for neologisms, but also uh, to use um, f to replace perfectly good uh, words that were Persian, sometimes Persian by Arabic, from Arabic, but had come to the region as part of the Persian language. So, in a predominantly agricultural country, the word for agriculture is a literal translation from the Russian word, even though there's a perfectly good Persian word for it. That gets replaced. Uh, Again, my favorite example of uh, these in, uh, inclusions from Russian, though, reflect that even Russian has picked up a lot of external influence. So in uh, Tajik and the Soviet era, if you were an uh, athlete who competed in you know, major athletic competition, were sportsmen ha, and if you won, you were champion ha. <laughs> uh, If Persian, that is the, the standard language of Iran, were taught in Soviet schools, it was taught as a foreign language. And it, frankly, it just wasn't taught much in Soviet schools in any case. Another significant development is two successive language changes, uh, alphabet changes that affected the Persian language. Uh, the first one, was the introduction of the Latin alph alphabet, which began in 1928 and implemented over several years. Uh, and in the wake of that, private teaching of the Arabic alphabet, if you were caught doing it, could be categorized as religious instruction, and that was a crime. And then in 1940, there was a switch from the Latin alphabet to the Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, officially as a way of aiding people to uh, learn Russian because the Russian language was also being promoted. But another consequence of these two successive alphabet switches is that this made literature written before the changes inaccessible to the vast majority of people who then studied uh, Tajik in school. So even though you went from a region with a very low literacy rate in the pre-Soviet era to one which developed a something like a 98% adult literacy rate. By later on in the Soviet period, they couldn't read unless they came from a few families which harbored all the books and still secretly taught the Arabic language. They couldn't read the literature that had been written in the Arabic from before uh, Soviet times. The uh, there was not much access even to literature in the Cyrillic alphabet in Tajik in the late, in the Soviet era. Uh, for one thing, uh, Tajiks didn't buy many books in Tajik, uh, literary or otherwise, even in the late Soviet era when there were lots more educated uh, Tajik speakers in the Central, Soviet Central Asia. Uh, it's estimated that maybe two to three percent of the books on sale in bookstores in the Tajikistan SSR uh, in uh, the late Soviet period were in Tajik. The rest were in Russian. Uh, and also, even though Tajikistan had near universal literacy by the late Soviet period, Tajikistan had the lowest rate of reader, book readership of any of the 15 Soviet republics. 
At the same time uh, all of this was going on, there was intensive promotion of the Russian language, not only because a large multi-ethnic state needed something to be a lingua franca, but this went even further. We looked already at the example of the intrusion in the sense of Russian vocabulary and idiomatic expressions into Tajik, but also uh, the way Russian was taught, uh, there was an attempt to communicate the idea of how glorious the Russian language is in a way that there was no message about the richness of the Tajik literary heritage. Uh, then people who learned Russian had better job prospects in any number of kinds of jobs. And there were schools that taught entirely in Russian in Tajikistan as in any Soviet Republic. And many parents who wanted good job opportunities for their children would send their chil children to these Russian language schools. Uh, by the late Soviet era at Tajikistan State University, the faculty members and students who did things related to Tajik language or Persian were paid less than the people who did Russian language and literature, which also sends a message. Now, most of the Tajik speakers lived in rural areas in Tajikistan, roughly three quarters of the total population. And schools in rural areas, even though they were likely to teach in Tajik, uh, in areas where Tajiks predominated, they were routinely underfunded in all sorts of ways. And uh, my favorite example being that by the end of the Soviet era, when people were reason realizing computers were important, uh, people in Tajik language schools, especially in the countryside, and even in some of the towns were taught theoretical computing, which means someone held up a picture of a computer and said, this is a computer. Uh, there was a general scarcity of textbooks in Tajik. And uh, for certain kinds of skilled trades, let alone things that required higher education, there were only textbooks in Russian. They didn't exist in Tajik. So if you wanted to learn how to be, do skilled jobs in factories, for example, you couldn't study that in Tajik. The Soviet version of the Tajik cultural heritage, literature and otherwise, as of the heritage of other Central Asian peoples, was that they had very little of note. Uh, the message was that they were all formerly backward people. And that's a little translation of the term. They didn't begin to make progress until they were brought into the Tsarist Empire in the 19th century, and then they really made progress when they were uh, brought under Soviet rule. And in, over the course of the Soviet era, there was the ex concept of the Russian elder brother, who was leading the former backward peoples, Tajiks and others, towards progress. There was also the constraint of internationalism that was required of literature, which meant uh, you couldn't focus on your own ethnic group if you were Tajik, right? Writing in Tajik or in Russian. Uh, you had to include positive representations of members of other nationalities. And of course, the most important of all of these other nationalities was Russians. And in fact, uh, there was a big controversy in the 1920s when someone who played, who was a Tajik, who became a communist and paid, played a crucial role both in the shaping of what became literary Tajik and defining what is Tajik literature, uh, a man by the name of Sadruddin Aini, uh, who uh, got in trouble for trying to argue that various people who centuries before had written major works in Persian, whether they were Ferdosi, who at least was from Khorasan, so sort of in the neighborhood, but you know, Hafez or somebody else who not from the neighborhood, that all of these people should be called part of the Tajik literary heritage. And this was uh, denounced as being reactionary and monarchist, and, uh, and that Persian was the language of Iran, not the language of the Tajiks, 
and the book ended up being mostly pulped by 1930. Uh, there was a return to this tactic in the post-World War II uh, era when uh, there was propaganda about the danger of pan-Iranism, which nobody else seems to have noticed existed, but the Soviet authorities <laughs> did, and it became an argument again for uh, trying to maximize the, the differentiation between what's the Persian cultural, uh, the Persian cultural heritage and the Tajik cultural heritage. Uh, for the sake of fleeting time, I will um, leap ahead to some developments at the end of the Soviet era, very end, and the post-Soviet era. Uh, there was more of an interest, finally, in teaching some uh, of the classics of Persian literature <coughs> in the schools. There was even talk of a return to using the Arabic alphabet, but this in, became, for practical reasons, impossible. Um, there were, uh, I might add, in reaction to demonstrations from, uh, by, mostly by students, in the capital in 1989, and similar kinds of demonstrations taking place in some of the other Soviet non-Russian republics in favor of higher status for the nationality, for the language of the eponymous nationality of the republic. There was a Tajik language law that was written. Uh, it's the Tajik version is in rather awkward Tajik, reflecting the fact that it was written first in Russian and then translated into Tajik, which reflected the fact that uh, many of the people in the Tajik ruling elite by the end of the Soviet era and beginning of the independence period were really much more comfortable functioning in Russian than they were in Tajik. The attitude towards Iran has been an odd so sort of mixture, depending on who's doing it. Uh, a number of the intellectuals who were interested in the broader Persianate cultural heritage and of rehabilitating that were also people who were interested in political reforms at the end of the Soviet period and early independence period. And they didn't win the power struggle and their stance, therefore, uh, was undermined. Uh, the ruling elite uh, discovered by the end of the Soviet period that they better adopt some sort of ideology to legitimize them because no one believed in Marxism, Leninism anymore. And the main way people in most of the formerly Soviet republics did this was to emphasize nationalism. So you could have Russian speaking veteran communist uh, officials in Tajikistan who had recently been denouncing Tajik writers for being national chauvinists. Not, not enough positive depictions of Russian is the translation of that, suddenly discovering Tajik nationalism and pushing it for all it's worth in the hope of somebody, please support us for some reason. Uh, you also had the regime, again, veteran communists talking to the officials in the Islamic Republic of Iran saying, we have so much in common in terms of our religion and our language and our history this and not that, an interesting play from veteran communists who have recycled themselves as the Tajik leadership. So you know, if you can provide aid, we love you. But against members of the uh, political opposition in Tajikistan, the same political figures who say, we love Iran if you send us aid, uh, but Opposition figures are agents of the Islamic Republic of Iran trying to create an Islamic Republic in Tajikistan, which the political opposition has no interest in doing, but you know, any smear will work in politics. Do I need to explain that when we're sitting here in Washington? <laughs> so with, if you have further questions, I'll, I'll be glad to take them afterwards. Thank you, Muriel. Uh, and now for our third uh, uh, presenter, uh, Professor Rajma Osman of uh, Temple University. She will uh, 
present uh, a paper or a presentation with a wonderful title, Silencing the Unruly. As a section head here, this is, uh, <laughs> will perhaps be illustrative and informative to me. Anyway, Silencing the Unruly, the Lives, Legends, and Verses of Early Persian Women Poets. Uh, uh, Professor Osman, as I said, is at Temple University uh, at the Department of Media Studies and Production. Uh, she received her master's and PhD from New York University uh, in the departments of Media, Culture, and Communication. I believe that's where you did your doctorate? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then in uh, Near Eastern Studies, and that's where she received her master's. Uh, her research focuses on global and transnational media, media development, uh, or media development in conflict and post-conflict areas, democracy, uh, the public sphere formation through the lenses of gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, and class. Her critically acclaimed documentary, Postcards from Tora Bora, has been uh, screened uh, both nationally and internationally at quite a number of film festivals. So without further ado, Professor Osman. Um, I think I'm probably the only one that has a PowerPoint, uh, probably because I'm in media studies and we have to put together some kind of visuals. Um, so let me just. Um, that's an image of Rabia Balchi, one of the people I'll, speak, I'll be speaking about. So I just want to have that up while I give a little bit of a background. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for organizing this, um, and particularly uh, Kevin for inviting me. Um, Kevin had um, asked me initially to speak about my um, dissertation research, uh, which um, and particularly he wanted me to talk about, which is about media in Afghanistan, and he wanted me to talk about the cultural exchanges between Iran and Afghanistan. Um, but I um, wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to be um, in this space with so many um, scholars and experts in um, Persian historical um, and literary texts. So um, I decided to um, present some, a little bit more of a historical project that's been a, a side uh, project for me. Um, and um, I, um, as I said, uh, my, my master's is in, in history and Middle Eastern studies and my uh, PhD is in, is in um, media studies. So I really um, hope to get some feedback and further contextualization about some of the historical themes that I'm working through. Um, and I'll also, because I promised Kevin that I would tie the historical things and present some of my current research on uh, the media situation in Afghanistan. So I will present some of my uh, current research as well, but um, I'm going to go through it fast just because of the, the time constraint. But I'm happy to take any questions people have at the end uh, about my current research as well. Um, so while the canon of classical Persian poets has long been established by the likes of Ferdowsi, Rumi, Saadi, and Afiz, the historical role of women Persian poets in the pre-modern and early modern Persianite world has been less defined. In this essay, I will explore the role and influence of three lesser known, well actually I'm going to do two, uh, lesser known uh, women poets and their connective experience across time and space. Um, one of the poets was Beydeli, um, who, um, not to be confused with Beydil, um, but there just wasn't enough information on her, so I'm not going to get into it as much here. Um, so the two uh, poets under consideration are Rabia Balchi from the 10th century and the daughter of Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb uh, Ziban Nusa uh, from the 1700s. Um, while their male, male contemporaries have been ubiquitously translated and have garnered a global following, why have these female poets not uh, yet to receive their equal due? I argue that this is not mere oversight, but a systematic silencing by powerful institutions that span centuries. These poetesses rock the bedrock of their own societies with their fierce verses 
and unabashedly and heroically challenged cultural, religious, and political norms and codes. Um, of the aristocracy, these women were subjected to imprisonment and even death for challenging the rule of their brothers and fathers with their verses. Their life stories marked by defiance to tradition, including the fact that they met tragic consequences, has further elevated their mythic stature and have made them beloved figures of legend. Um, so how I came about uh, studying these poets is um, I uh, did my dissertation research in academic year 2009-2010 in Afghanistan and uh, while I was in uh, the bazaar of the Shah of Kona, which is the old city of Kabul, I found all these books that um, were in almost every bookstore. Um, and I have a list of these books, but um, for you know, the sake of time, I won't mention them, but I, I you know, bought and brought back as many as I could, and they're mostly published between 2000, after the post 9-11 period, so 2005 to 2000. Nine, um, but um, they're, and they're published mostly in Kabul, for the exception of one, which is called Women's Poetry of Afghanistan, by Dr. Masood uh, Mirshahi, which was published published in Iran in 2007. Um, and one of the ones that I, I found um, really useful was um, it was called The Glimpse of Women at the in the Timuran Reign by uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah Kargar. Uh, which was published in Kabul. Um, so this is, this is how I became more interested in these women poets. Um, but first what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about my, uh, my master's and dissertation research just so I can connect um, these early female poets to uh, the contemporary situation. Uh, my master's thesis was called Contentious Births, Modernity and Gender Rights in Afghanistan. Um, from the time of Amman Allah Khan to the War of Terror, um, I wanted to draw correlations in how Afghanistan's attempts with modernity have been described in Western literature and academic accounts. In development circles and in political science terminology, Afghanistan is frequently described as failed, broken, fragmented, or collapsed nation. Terms that have replaced earlier classifications of late state formation, the rentier state, and third world despotism. The language of failure is ubiquitous with its problematic colonial and neo-colonial epistemological roots, um, and it's usually used as a theological framework. Social change and progressive ref reform is almost always solely the domain of the West, uh, where in the East, we try to inadequately mimic it. Um, the common perception among Western historians for the failure is the ignorance of the majority of the Afghan population. And I quote, um, this is from um, an early um, document from um, a British vo vi viceroy in Afghanistan, or at the time um, he was stationed in, in British India. He says, quote, um, this is referring to Amman Allah Khan's time period. It says, Amman Allah's attempt to modernize so backwards a country uh, made it inevitable that the foreign press should take an unusual amount of interest in the revolt. So this, this word, constant uh, usage of the word backward to describe the population. And another historian writes, quote, um, whereas their pan-Islamist and nationalist teaching and clamor for complete independence of Afghanistan appeal to the masses and political and religious leaders. Their modernist views, however, in the absence of cohesive social force lacked similar support. Um, as scholars have shown, it's usually through gendered contestation that attempts at setting and defining national, cultural, social identity often occur and in the sing singular. Um, so women bear the burden of national identity politics often. Uh, it's through women's bodies that these types of things are uh, delineated. Um, so I compare um, the rhetoric about, um, I compare this rhetoric to the rhetoric about Afghanistan and Afghan women that proliferated in the post 9-11 period. 
Tapping into the vast lexicon of imagery from the era of colonialism, claims about saving Afghan women were used to justify um, a military operations against ta the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. In keeping with the rhetoric of what's often referred to um, in gender studies as masculinist protectionism, the pretext of saving Afghan women added further ammunition to avenge the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Evident in the proliferation of media such as fiction films, this television programs, documentaries, books, and news that focused on the plight uh, of women under repressive Islamic regimes. And so, I, I don't know if people remember, but after 9-11, this was part of my master's research, there was um, a proliferation of films and also uh, programs on CNN with uh, titles such as Behind the Veil, Beneath the Veil, Beyond the Veil. So it's this, yeah, it was, yeah, a lot of this. Um, so scholars from a variety of disciplines have criticized the overwhelming portrayal of Afghan women and Eastern women more generally as victims, a portrayal that, that failed to account for their actual or potential energy uh, agency. Um, and these are people like Saba Mahmoud, uh, Laila Bouagad, all of them have written about this. Um, and this has also been described as the classic um, rape and rescue fantasy, which, um, which Robert Stamm and Ella Shohat describe in their book, Unthinking Eurocentricism. Um, and they say it's um, that the West imagined the colonized, quote, the colonized land and its inhabitants both as virginal and as obscenely desiring, end quote. Um, so what I noticed in the post 9-11 period is that Avian culture is once again interpolated as static, unchanging, and bound by archaic problematic traditions. Um, so my goal with my dissertation research uh, was to redirect the global dialogue um, through the media about Afghanistan to local Afghans themselves. And so I spent about two years there uh, studying the media. And the title of my dissertation, um, which I finished uh, in 2012, is called Thinking Outside the Box, Television and the Afghan Culture Wars. Um, so I don't really have time to go through it in detail, but I'm just gonna flip through some slides. But uh, what I wanted to do was consider local cultural contestations and social movements. Um, and thereby complicate the false binaries between religiosity and secularism and simplistic discourses of progress, development, hum and humanitarian and human rights intervention. Um, things that Talal Assad and Partha Chatterjee, among other people, have talked about. Um, so this is, this is a, a quick glimpse of some of my uh, research from um, Afghanistan, so this is a U.S. soldier protecting a telecom tower that broadcasts radio, television, and mobile phone signals. Um, these are different types of genres. Afghanistan has uh, more free broadcast uh, television stations than any of its bordering countries, uh, some produced in collaboration with the West as well as other countries, and some locally produced. Um, so I look at dramatic serials, and these include um, soap operas um, from India, Iran, Turkey, other places. This is a shopping bazaar in Kabul. Um, this is Prerna, who's a famous uh, TV and uh, movie actress. I look at reality TV. This is uh, Afghan Star, which uh, this is the poster for the film, which uh, a British filmmaker made and was won numerous awards and was aired on, on uh, HBO. Um, and it's funded predominantly by USAID. Um, so these are some images from that. Um, and I also look at PSAs, public service announcements in the news. Uh, so this is me with some television reporters on a US diplomatic uh, mission um, after there was some civilian casualties. This is the exterior of the Ministry of Information and Culture, um, which has been, um, at this point, the, the, the road is completely closed because it was so many times came under attack. Um, and these are some people who've been um, killed. These are um, telecommunication engineers 
who were killed by the Taliban in the south trying to set up these towers. Um, this is um, Shikiba um, um, Hamaj uh, Rezai, who was also killed. She was a host of a, um, of a music video show. She was killed as well. And some people identified these as honor killings. Um, she was a, a news broadcaster. Um, this is Rizak Mamun, who uh, wrote a piece, um, wrote a book on, on Iran, and he said, according to him, he was attacked by Iranian government agents. Um, this, uh, this is um, Sultan Mamun, who um, was killed by ISAF, the International Security Armed Forces. He was a journalist, um, and at the time working with the New York Times reporter as a fixer. Um, okay, so I'll leave that there, and we'll continue. So that's just a very brief glimpse, and we can talk more about that if you'd like to know more. Um, so b tying this into um, um, the early female poets, um, when I came back, my sister is um, a printmaker, and she's an artist, so we, we decided to make a, um, a short artist book that's all handmade and designed, and this is the website for it. Um, so it's only about, I mean, it, I, you know, this is something that I'm sure most people have experience with. For me, it's new. Translating took a very long time, and we did it collaboratively, and we only were able to do about 12 in the final edition, but we're gonna continue to do more. Uh, so it has about 12 poems that you could see online. Um, but, um, so for, for me, people like uh, Rabia Balchi and Zaban Nessa were uh, names that I grew up uh, hearing about and knowing about because uh, my parents have memorized verses of theirs and they recite it frequently. It's just something they do. And uh, somebody like Rabia Balchi in Afghanistan is really well known and um, there's been movies made about her. This is a still from a movie that was made in the 1960s about Rabia Balchi's life. And um, it was one of the films that the Taliban tried to destroy during their time period, but people able, were able to um, hide some of the archives from the National Film Archives and save, this was one of the films that were actually saved. Um, so there's hospitals named after her, schools, um, radio stations, you name it. She's a very popular figure. Um, her, as I said, her exact dates are unknown, but she's from the 10th century, and she wrote both in um, Arabic and in Persian. Um, and um, you know, one of the one of the uh, sites that I was looking information about, there was this huge argument in the comment section about whether she's uh, a Muslim poetess or not. So the idea that uh, at that time, based on her verses, this was one of the arguments people were having. Um, so this is her um, tomb in the Bakh province, um, hence her pen, pen name. Um, oh, this is Zabon Nassau, we'll get to her in a second. Um, she's, uh, so Rabia Balchi is the daughter of um, Kab al-Khazadari, uh, uh, who was a Samanad Khan, and um, the, she was also the brother of Haras, who inherited his father's position. And then the last uh, cast of character, I will call it, in this, um, in this drama is um, Baktash, who is a, um, Turkic slave that of her brother Haras's, and so according to legend, um, and there you know these types of things there's there hasn't been any um, evidence for, and this is something we can talk further about. But Rabia, Rabia and uh, Baktash had a secret love affair. Haras finds out, imprisons Baktash in a well, and cuts Rabia's um, veins in a bathhouse where she writes her final poem with her blood on the walls. Baktash escapes, discovers what has happened, and kills Haras, and then commits suicide. So that's one version. Another version is that um, when, when uh, Haras finds out, he exiles Baktash. And another version, he kills Baktash. And then Rabia Balchi uh, falls into a depression and kills herself in the bathhouse. But it always ends with her in this bathhouse with Blood writing her last poem. And I didn't include those images, but there's plenty of those images online. So I was just trying to pull out some visuals for you here, where these dramatic images of her dying in, in a bathhouse with blood everywhere. Um, 
So uh, Reza Qali Khan Hidayat, uh, who is a Qajar uh, court poet, wrote Bakhtish Nama in honor of their love affair. So this is something that's been um, written about in history before. So the next and final um, poetess I will talk about is Zibon uh, Nisa, who's known by her pen name Mahfi. My parents always call her Mahfi. They don't, uh, they don't refer to her as uh, Zibon uh, Nisa, uh, which means the hidden one or the secret one. After her largest collection of poems in the book Devan and Mahfi, um, and in original sources, it said that there was supposed to be 15,000 verses, but it was published posthumously and um, has less than 5,000 that people managed to collect afterwards. And some people say, um, you know, there's, there's more that were destroyed. Um, so she was the eldest um, child of the notorious Mughal Empire, who's already been referenced here, uh, Aurangzeb, or some people call Alimgir by his title, um, and Aurangzib, uh, Aurangzib, sorry, disposed his father, uh, Shah Jahan, as emperor, and in the process killed several of his brothers, including the eldest, uh, Dara Shiku, who was the heir apparent. Um, and uh, Zaban Nassau herself was educated in the court by, um, at the time, the greatest thinkers and philosophers, and she was uh, fluent in Persian, Arabic, and Urdu. Um, so similar with the legend of Rabia Balkhi, there's a different, um, different specu speculations about her life story. Um, so um, some things that, that, that people have written is that she was her father's favorite child. However, historical uh, evidence or fact says that she was imprisoned by him for 20 years, for the last 20 years of her life, and she died in the Red Fort, which um, Aurangzeb had turned into a prison um, in Delhi. Um, so there's no evidence as to why she was in, in prison, but plenty of speculation. And I'll run through uh, a few of these. One is that, uh, well, Aurangzeb is cast in history as an austere ruler who was not in favor of music and poetry, uh, unlike her daughter and her proclivities for the arts. Um, he is cast as a pious Muslim and sometimes uh, more than a pious Muslim, as a brutal enforcer of Sharia law, while um, his older brother, Darya Shiku, and, and Zaban Nassar often cast in history as more secular with a pluralistic and inclusive view of society and the religions of the region. Um, so this is one reason, is that they had this, this, this uh, disagreements about, about um, the way society should be. Another reason people gave about why she was imprisoned uh, and died in prison for the last 20 years of her life is that she supported her brother Akbar's re rebellion to become an emperor. And then another reason um, is that um, he didn't approve of her love life, which leads us to uh, another big mystery, similar to Rabia Balkhi's uh, legends around her love life, is that, um, so a subject that's been equally uh, a source of bafflement and speculation, um, and also equal lack of historical evidence, is why she remained single all her life. So I'll run, into, run to, uh, through a few different uh, accounts that I've heard, um, nothing really corroborated. Um, so one, one interpretation I've read is that pe people pull out some of her verses for the de from the Divan and Mahfi, um, and um, they say that her verses suggest that she was devo devoted to a pious life of literary work and poetry, so that the, the Sufi concept of love and God and the beloved being always uh, God alone, um, that she devoted her life to just that type of pursuits. Um, and so, hence, remaining single. Another one, ooh, okay, only four minutes. Um, another is that she was in love with various dignitaries from different places in the region, including her cousin, uh, a prince, um, but that her father didn't approve of it. Um, so another is that she had multiple lovers and debau debaucherous affairs, um, which some people say was the custom of the Mughal court of the time. 
Um, and then the final reason that I've heard um, is that she was in love with a female slave of hers, a Canese. Her name was Mian Bay, and, and she has built her a garden, which I think, oh, these are some other images of her as Moho drawings. So this is the garden um, known locally as Mian Bay's garden in Lahore. The inscription over the main archway entrance reads in Persian, this garden and the pattern of the Garden of Paradise has been founded, and then there's a missing line, and then it says the garden has been bestow bestowed on Mian Bay by the bounty of Zaban Nesa Begum, the lady of the age. So this is the fourth type of speculation as to uh, why she never married. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna quickly um, read um, two poems by Zaban Nesa just as examples. Um, and these aren't ones that I've translated. These are ones that are available and other people have translated. Um, so this is Rizal number 44. You with the dark burly hair and the breathtaking eyes, your inquiring glance that leaves me undone, eyes that pierce and then withdraw like a blood-stained sword, eyes with dagger lashes. Zealots, you are mistaken. This is heaven. Never mind those making promises of the afterlife. Join us now, righteous friends, in this intoxication. Never mind the path to the Kaaba. Sanctity resides in the heart. Squander your life. Suffer. God is right here. So, and then a final short one is, I bow before the image of my love. No Muslim I, but an adulterer. I bow before the image of my, light, uh, of my love and worship um, her or him. No Brahmin I, my sacred thread I cast away. Round my neck I wear um, her pleated hair instead. So in conclusion, and I think this, this is it, is, um, is that there, these were just two brief examples, but their verses, as well as their life stories, um, challenged the orthodoxy, and they were against the prescribed norms promoting um, all types of different um, ways of being and conduct and the way they imagined society. Um, and not, not in keeping necessarily. In some verses, they were keeping in the Sufi order, and in other uh, verses, they were more carnal and promoted a type of worldly pr uh, pleasures as opposed to other worldly um, desires. Um, so in the post-9-11 world where classic stereotypes of women under Islam have gained New cu currency and women from the Persian-speaking region have become synonymous with oppression, repression, and victimhood. The verses of these women poets provide a counter-narrative to the mainstream media misrepresentations. Their poetry and life experiences offer a more accurate glimpse into the contestations and sociopolitical movements that shaped and continue to shape the Persianite world and beyond. In other words, Media producers in Afghanistan are challenging some of the same cultural issues as these early Persian poets of the past. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to uh, Professor Usman. And um, we have, uh, as it were, a coffee break time, which we have run over into slightly, but um, I will uh, presume upon the audience to uh, allow a couple of questions, but not more than that, because we do want to have some time to mix and uh, speak. So, yes, in the very back. And address, you know, please address to whichever one of the professors. Uh, yes. uh, I'm not from Tajikistan, journalist from Tajikistan, and my question goes to Dr. Elkin. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, I'm perhaps one of the representatives of that generation who has been given the Russian language education in order to, to make better career. But then Soviet Union crashed and <laughs> yeah. But, uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, uh, Tajik uh, in recent years there were a lot of discussion in Tajik society about switching to, to Arabic alphabet and uh, there are a lot of people 
uh, who say we should do this, we must do this because we have a, a huge uh, heritage in our history in Persian uh, alphabet and some other people say no, it's impossible because in this case all Tajik population, Tajik people will again will, be, uh, will become illiteral. What do you think? Uh, will Tajikistan uh, sooner or <coughs> or they will change the alphabet or and should the system do it? Well, I certainly don't know what will happen. The luxury of being a historian is I get to post-dict the past <laughs> rather than predict the future. Uh, when this issue was also being raised in the early 1990s, I mean, one of the practical problems <coughs> was that there weren't the type fonts. I, there wasn't the physical means to print a lot of things in the Arabic alphabet. There was also the consideration that you just made that in a country where there is near universal adult literacy, you would instantly make people illiterate uh, and they'd have to learn a whole new language. And also, with all the different kinds of concerns that Tajikistan has nowadays about making its way internationally, and uh, you know, in diplomatic and economic terms, especially uh, development terms, is it more useful to be using the Arabic alphabet or stick with the familiar alphabet and maybe learn some Western languages? So that's part of the debate as well. You know, knowledge of knowledge of Russian has not lost all use. Of usefulness. And then there's the question, if you learn some other language other than Tajik, what is the most useful one for the country's most pressing current needs to use? As, as for what the government will decide, I have no clue. Uh, Dr. Osman, could you just continue on where you uh, start um, in terms of Afghanistan's media scene, and what are the kind of challenging work that is being done? What are the kind of interesting? Just a little more about the, the, the point on that. Okay, I'll, I'll try to summarize uh, seven chapters in like two, two sentences. I'm working on my manuscript now. Um, but basically, uh, my argument is so about 67% of, of Afghanistan's. Um, gross national income comes from the international community. And most of that is from the US. And a good percentage of that goes to the media. And it's part of, part of uh, you know, media diplomacy or heart winning hearts and minds are very extinct, which has been critiqued extensively from the left. However, my argument is that it's created such a, such a um, vibrant public sphere because you know, we have uh, over three dozen, and most people are illiterate, so over three dozen broadcast TV stations and countless radio stations that it's allowed all different groups, including different ethnic groups, to be able to generate this dialogue, right? So it's creating a certain amount of, um, I mean, of course, there's plenty of contestations. There's fights and between, um, you know, it's continuing some of the earlier ethnic violence and gender violence, but at the same time, overall, I think the effect is very positive because it's creating an amount of, of healing by talking about these things. And the, the, I've noticed that the, the stations that were the most successful were the ones that downplayed their ethnic identity entirely. So they had a nationalist, plural, um, you know, inclusive unity message. And they were the ones that by far the, more pop, the most popular. And so in addition to producing the local programming with international money, the international community is also dubbing programs into local languages from you know, all the neighboring countries as well as from the West. And so uh, in, in my conclusion, I say that you know, people have very high expectations of the media there, whether it's to avenge ethnic murders and and all kinds of other cultural uh, traditions, uh, particular to gender and other things, but that overall it's meeting its mission and, and through this, this very unique type of media economy that's, that doesn't really exist in other places. 
of the Persian that society. The man who told me was as high as he could be. He said, look, I will lose my job. And he was a minister of the cabinet. He said, that's impossible. And so I, I, I might actually come back to you to, to get the Iranian aspect from that. Thank you very much. Well, with that, we're going to close this panel. I want to thank you. everyone. Let's not uh, take any more time. Thank you very much for joining us again, and thank you for uh, being here for the second panel. I'm Hirad Navari, uh, the Iranian World Reference uh, Librarian, and I would also like to uh, suggest that after the lunch you have today, if you want to stop by and look at the exhibition upstairs, it would be worth your time. We have three more uh, panelists speaking in the second round. I start with um, Ms. Pardis Minuche uh, and give you a brief bio, and she will then start with her program and uh, her lecture. Uh, Pardis Minuche received um, a uh, PhD from Columbia University and an MA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She uh, completed her uh, BA in Tehran at the Allame Taba Taba University in Iran. She is currently a director of Persian program and assistant professor of Persian at George Washington University. Her research uh, focuses uh, on studies on modern Persian, the intellectual discourses of constitutional revolution, the Iranian press, gender discourses, Iranian cinema and arts, language and literature, medieval literature, Islamic mysticism, and Persian language teaching and learning. Without taking any f further time, um, Paradis John, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, Harad, for the introduction. And thank, um, I want to first thank the Library of Congress for organizing this event, the Roshan Institute, uh, Fatima, Ahmad, and um, all of the, the, the audience here. And Kevin, of course, for organizing this event. Um, thank you so much. Uh, since the, the title of the, the um, conference is The Wide World of Persian Connections and Contestations, 1500 to Today, I thought maybe I'll start first with the 1500s. So in the 1500s, what happened to the Persian culture? Persian culture, literature, arts, architecture, and painting reached its cultural and political zenith in, in the 1500s. There was a colorful and rich landscape of this period that can be attributed to the rivalry of three emerging empires. These three em empires, the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughals extended geographically from the Straits of Bosphorus. I think, does, does this map show? Oh, maybe, the, yes, a little bit, huh? Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> yes, no. it does. Not really, huh? All the way to, no, no it doesn't. <laughs> okay. Um, the Straits of Bosphorus crossing, crossing Asia Minor, it shows Asia Minor, the Iranian Plateau, and Central Asia, Transoxiana, Hindu Kush, and into the subcontinent, all the way to the Bay of Bengal. This vast geographical area populated over one fourth of the world at the time. So the population of the world uh, was concentrated in this area mainly. And, um, and this situation contributed to what Bert Fragner has called the polycentric nature of the Persian language, meaning that there were multiple centers of language and literature. There wasn't like, like today you have Tehran, Kabul, and uh, Dushanbe, but it, it was more than that. Uh, the, there were cities and urban centers such as Herat, Tus, Shiraz, Lahore, uh, Samarkand, Bukhara, and Isfahan. Um, so how did this all start? In 1501, you all know a, a Sufi sheikh, sheikh master called Ismail, started a series of conquests from Ardabil that marked the beginning of the Safavid Empire. He soon conquered Tabriz, and within 10 years, he took, took over so many major areas to the north, east, west, and south of Tabriz. Ismail soon called himself the Padishah Iran and established what we know today as the Safavid Empire. 
It is known that while the court language was uh, Persian, but Shah Ismail himself had a divan, a collection of poetry uh, called Divan Khatai in Azari or Chagatai, um, Turkic language. In spite of this, the Safavids became patrons of Persian culture and literature, even though the, they themselves were not uh, Persian speakers at home. And there are you know, a lot of magnificent works of art and architecture that can be attributed, uh, that are attributed to the Safavid period. During the Safavids, P Persian poetry gained social and political uh, prestige with notable achievements. And I know that in the, in the book exhibit here, the Persian book exhibit, you have representatives of, of the Safavid um, period, yes. <clears throat> like his Persian, like its Persian counterpart in um, 1504, Babur conquered Kabul in the beginning series of conquest expansions of what established the Mughals in India. Babur was a descendant of both Timur and Changiz, or Timur and Changiz Khan, and his mother tongue, again, was not Persian, but a, a Turco-Mongol, Chagatai probably language, but his court and administrative language continued in Persian, especially under the successor Homayun, who had fled to Persia and returned to become one of the most ardent patrons of Persian poetry and prose. However, it wasn't until Akbar, who was the first among the Indo-Islamic kings of northern India, to formally declare Persian to be the language of administration at all levels. Muzaffar Alam's article um, and his research um, called The Pursuit of Persian Language and Mughal Politics states that the Mughal lit literary culture has been noted for its notable achievements in poetry and a wide range of prose writings in Persian. In terms of profusion and variety of themes, this literary output was also perhaps incomparable. He, um, Alam, attributes the rise of Persian in northern India as a direct result of court pa patronage, a court whose language in the beginning was a Chagatai Turkic language and gradually excelled and surpassed in Persian in a phenomenal way. What was more interesting uh, was that the Mughals looked up to the uh, Persians, to the Safavids, and uh, as Aurangzeb, one of the last Mughal uh, great um, Shah's claims, no other this is Aurangzeb talking about the Persians. No other nation is better than the Persians for acting as clerks. And I think this is monshis, meaning writers here, not, not like desk clerks, but you know, uh, writers and literati. And in war too, from the age of Emperor Homayun to the present time, none of this nation has turned his face away from the field and their firm feet have never been shaken. Thus learning, knowledge, and high culture was associated with the Mughal Indian society after the 1500s. In fact, the process of Persianization was so internalized that the Mughals became very concerned with the process of uh, the purification of Persian, and they called it tathir -e farsi so they were very much involved. Around the same time as the Mughals, this was happening in the Mughal Empire and Safavid Empire, the Ottomans also, uh, who had started their their court, the, their court language as Persian, um, they also tried to establish the language that is full of flowery. Um, flowery Persian words and vocabulary and uh, Persian constructs and um, was, was uh, to, to such an extent that it was not understood after a while by the Ottoman, uh, uh, the, by the Turks, the, uh, the Turks themselves. Um, and, and you may remember that Sultan Salim's Divan now, remember that Shah Ismail wrote in, in a Turkic uh, language for his divan, but Sultan Salim wrote in Persian, uh, a Persian divan. Um, so in order to understand what happened in the 1500s and why 
I think we need to take one step back and question, namely, how could a language like Persian emerge as a widely used lingua franca in the 1500s, covering more than a quarter of the world's population? How did modern Persian, and when, when we see, say modern here, mo modern Persian is probably the oldest modern language in the world because it's older than modern German, older than modern French, or modern English, and it's, it's almost a thousand years uh, old. How did this modern Persian emerge from origin originally an Indo-Iranian variety of Middle Persian, Pahlavi, and evolve into a widely linguistic medium of communication and administration? Now, linguistically speaking, those of you who know Persian and, and the crowd here, this is the, the overwhelming uh, number of participants here, that you all know that Persian was a, a user-friendly language compared to the existing languages of Arabic, Sohdi, or Sanskrit, um, had no distinction of grammatical gender, had a simplified morphology, um, ver um, simplified verbal system and nominal infl inflections and used basic Arabic vocabulary to, um, to serve its own purposes. But uh, there are actually two main theories th that are contradictory in nature um, that examine the evolution of uh, Persian as a lingua franca in the region from a cultural perspective. So what is the first theory? The first theory claims that Persian is the language of Islam, the language that embraced the new religion after the seventh century conquest, and a language that became a vehicle for its expansion. This th theory treats the Persian language to be one of the main languages of Islam, if not its first language. The second theory inherently contradicts the first one and believes in, a na in, in Persian being a nationalist agenda for the Persian language. Uh, um, it claims that the survival of Persians after the conquest represents the legacy of those who resisted the Arabization of the Persian Empire, those who managed to preserve the language of their forefathers in the face of calamity and distress, which was resulted by the Arab conquest. Now, I mentioned Bert Fragner, the author of the German handbook Persephone, actually sides with the first group. Now, uh, if you say the, you know, the, the Islamic Republic sides with the first group, it's understandable. But this is a German scholar who strongly believes that Persian should be considered as the first language of the Muslim Arab conquerors in the process of Islamization. He says the Persian language was not the language of cultural resistance to Islamization. It was more the language of the process of Islamization. And by adopting the Arabic script, uh, but a Perso-Arabic vocabulary, the early Muslims created a language that they could take from land to land as a court and administrative language. This is still Fragner uh, talking. Thus, the language that early Muslims adopted and expanded was not really Arabic, but the modern Persian language. Um, and this is if you go to the, fa uh, to the um, websites in Iran and look up the uh, Farhangistan, they, they don't say Persian is the first language of Islam, they call it the second language. So he is the, more Catholic than the Pope in, in this case. <laughs> in fact, okay, um, so, um, okay, so, he, so where does he get that? What, what happens? Um, what happens in the beginning of Islam that Persian becomes, becomes so prominent? According to an early degree, decree by Abu Hanifa, 699 to 767, who is one of the main four Sunni theological school leaders, the recitation of prayer in both Persian and Arabic was considered legitimate for prayer considering both languages to belong to the residents of heavens. And you know that up to this day, uh, you know, in Iran or in uh, Persian, um, uh, Persian countries, you don't, you, can, you are not allowed to uh, pray in Persian. But this is back then, in the, already in the seventh, eighth, early eighth century, that they were allowing, um, Abu Hanifa was allowing uh, the recita recitation of the Salat, the namaz in Persian. Um, now, 
this was not taken easily. It was a very controversial uh, ruling. It created a lot of rift, uh, especially some who uh, some came out and claimed that uh, Persian was a language of hell dwellers, <laughs> in contrast to what he had said. Uh, you know, Abu Hanifa had called it the language of heaven, residents of heaven. He said they said no. This is the language of hell dwellers. Um, but at the time, it's inter interesting because it was intended to consolidate power, convert non-Arabs, and alleviate tensions between the Persians and Arabs. And it shows how Persian came to be seen as a language of Muslim conquerors. Um, now, let's, on the other hand, the nationalist theory that I mentioned as the second theory views the Persian language to be one of the dis distinguishing factors between Arabs and Iranians, and it was based on the linguistics, uh, linguistic factors upon which Iranians proceeded to build their Iranian identity. In Shah Rukh Meskoub's words, and Shah Rukh Meskoub is, of course, not the only nationalist Iranian who claims this, but um, uh, this is widespread among, especially among Iranians. I don't know if the, it's that widespread among Afghans. Maybe we can talk about that later. But uh, Meskoup says, language was a foundation, floor, and refuge for the soul, a stronghold within which we stood in the face of the Arab atrocities co committed after the conquest. And this is in a book called Iranian National Identity and the Persian Language, 900 to 1900, The Roles of Court, Religion, and Sufism in Persian Prose Writing. Um, however, there are other Persian language specialists who believe that one should not theorize the rise of Persian language in relation to religious consideration. One major uh, scholar on this topic, uh, Lutz Shreha, claims that the evolution a modern Persian occurred mainly as a result of frequent trade between Khorasani merchants who brought the language from the Khorasan area into North Khorasm and Transoxiana, who happened to be Muslims. Um, now, I'm, I am quoting Jahak because I think uh, the, uh, Jahak's book on the evolution of Persian um, among Tajiks and uh, for, uh, for Tajiks is, is a seminal uh, um, reference book. And uh, um, it examines the transformation of the Persian language from, a big, from being a language of the multilingual society um, for centuries, the leading language of religion, science, literature, administration, correspondence, and trade to a language whose function has been reduced to the primary language defined according to national criteria of a speaker community. Uh, in the course of this transformation, the Persian language emerged as a decisive element for national identity, which I believe in your paper you'll, uh, you'll address that and, and, um, in more detail. In conclusion, in 1500s, the Persian language had already established itself as the language of learning, culture, and literature, but the court pa patronage of three major empires expanded its reach and status. The moder modern Persian language's religious and nationalist functions changed from region to region, whether it was uh, among the Sunni Ottomans, the Shia, Safa, the Shia Safavids, or the Din Elahi Mughals under Akbar, but it remained an administrative lingua franca up until the 19th century in the region, extending throughout a large geographical area from the Straits of Bosphorus to the Bay of Bengal, um, as well as north to Samarkand and Bukhara, and all throughout and beyond the Iranian plateau, which you see here in, the, in this map. The major efforts to standards of a Persian language, however, occurred mainly in the 20th century when the title of official language, Zabon Rasmi, and I saw there was some discussion on that topic, was given to the language that underwent state policies in Iran, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan in the age of uh, nation states within a national context. I think I'll leave it there, and then could, if you have any questions, I could answer it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Minichair, for that. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor William Fleur, uh, who is a well-known independent scholar. Um, 
and he has studies. Uh, he has studied uh, development, economics, and non-Western sociology, as well as Persian, Arabic, Islam, Islam Islamology, uh, from 1963 to 67 at the University of Utrecht, the Netherlands. Uh, he received his doctorate de degree from the University of Langdon in uh, 1971. He has published widely uh, on a variety of topics related to Safavid and Qajar Iran. His latest book, The Persian Gulf, The Hula Arabs of the uh, Shib Kuh Coast of Iran, is the, the latest item that Mage Publishing has just put out. Without taking any further time, um, Professor Fleur, thank you very much. I'm not a professor, by the way. Never been. Independent scholar. We don't William either. Oh, uh, well, yes. Well, it's at least better than when they say, you know, when I say that, oh, they say, oh, sorry, Wilhelm. I said, no. I mean, <laughs> what is easier than Wilhelm? Anyway, you know, the Chirach Koshi just means extinguishing uh, candles. And so why is it a used trauma for me? Why? You know, I think I was 18 when I read... Uh, uh, Morius uh, Haji, Haji Baba, and in a footnote it explains what Shirak Kosham was. And I thought, well, it was odd. By the way, that didn't, that did not lead to my interest in Iran, by the way. It was another book, but okay. Um, in fact, I forgot about Iran after that. I had, to, I, okay, well, it's another story. Anyway, uh, and so now after more than many years, <coughs> I come back to the Shirak Kosham. Well, as I said, you know, it means extinction. So why, why, you know, uh, bother about extinguishing uh, candles? I mean, gee, I mean, you can't very really lie awake about that one. Well, the point is, let's say, it became used as of 1500. Uh, it was very nice of the, the Persians to start using it, th having in mind this conference, um, uh, to, as a pejorative to label heterodox groups. And what actually means or what did they want to um, uh, say when they used this term? And I quote now from K Kinnear, who around 1810 wrote the following. I have been informed that the nocturnal festivals which the people of Kerend, which is in Kurdistan, or on Bakhtaran nowadays, the garments of the fair sex at the expiration of a certain period are thrown into a heap and jumbled together. This being accomplished, the lights are extinguished and the cloth being regularly distributed among the men, the candles are relighted and it's, it is settled by the rules of society that the lady must patiently submit to the embraces of the person who has become possessed of her dress, whether father, son, husband or brother. The lights are then once more extinguished, and the whole of this licentious stripe pass the remainder of the night in the indulgence of the most promiscuous lust. Well, I mean, that's a nice advertisement to join the club, isn't it? I mean, if you like lust, that is, especially when it's promiscuous. Uh, now, this term was used for the first time, I said, in early Safavid period, uh, but let's say, the, the pejorative to, to refer, let's say, to people who extinguish uh, candles to hold orgies and have, let's say, with women, it was not, uh, is, let's say, predates that period. You know, we had already, let's say, similar ex accusation in the Sasanian period against the Mazdakites who held women. And the early Christians, for example, had a had a, um, uh, um, a ritual which was called tenebre, which in Latin means basically darkness, and where, let's say, they uh, had, and, and I come back to that later, they had, let's say, women and men and women were together, and they extinguished them slowly as part of the ritual seven, um, seven uh, candles, and then men and women kiss one another, it's called in Greek agape, uh, which means basically that's a non well, uh, non-corporal love, it's a spiritual love. And of course, because of that, uh, given that the early Christians were also in the Middle East and where people were rather not so licential, licentious in, the, uh, in mixing the sexes, uh, this, of course, was shocking. 
I mean, it's indeed it is. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, you got, uh, 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 when uh, Iran became Islamic, uh, well, you know, there was plenty of uh, opportunity to brand other uh, people with the same sort of label. Uh, the the, the, the Al-Muqanna heresy was also known for, uh, uh, you know, sharing women, uh, uh, the Khoramedinis, uh, the Karmatis, etc. So that when um, uh, uh, the, uh, the Safavids started, they had a sort of thing to fall back on. Now, what made it more, let's say, um, interesting at the time, uh, a lot of Turks were incorporated in the Iranian society at that time. And the Turks, before they became Muslim, had a, a custom where, where for li religious ceremonies, men and women were together. And they came together in a circle, which was co called Ayine Jam or Jam, and which is st still practiced amongst uh, several groups. And they continued that practice after they had become uh, Muslim. And of course, that was shocking to Muslims because, you know, uh, religious experience uh, or devotions have to be done separately by men and women. Um, and so that raised at least uh, eyebrows and later even more things because um, the, um, uh, this kind of behavior, of course, was suspicious. The first time that the term is used uh, is, uh, uh, may have been in a, a mogul work, the um, uh, Johar uh, Aftab Chi, the, one of the servants of Humayun, when he came to Iran, explains that one of the courtiers who was on the advanced party of, of um, uh, Humayun um, uh, came to Shah Tahmat, who wanted him to become a, uh, a, a uh, Isna Ashari, and the guy refused. And then he said, uh, well, then, uh, you know, if you don't obey me, who is the lord of the universe, then you have, uh, have to be killed. And so he ordered to get some Chirach Koshan from the prison because they were heretics and he, they had to kill him. Now, at the same time, there was another source that mentioned Chirach Koshan, was Dukhlat, who wrote in Chagatai. And he uses, and that's interesting, he used it basically as a synonym for Mullah which was the traditional term before, mainly before 1500, as a, was a widely used term to refer in particular to Ismailis, but in general to anybody, you know, whom you disagreed with. Uh, and, um, uh, and then, let's say, Shah Tahmasp himself in his Taskere also uh, 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 refers to not only, let's say, to uh, necessarily to Ismailis, but let's say probably to Hulad, when Ulama Tekulu, you may, those of you who are familiar with, not familiar with Safavid history, there was one of the chiefs who def, uh, went over to the Ottoman site in 1531, and there was one group among his followers, the Sarlu, whom Tahmas accused of ilhat, idolatry, zandake, polytheism, vekahat, shamelessness, and ibahat, lewdness, and they do not withhold their wives from each other. Uh -huh. Now we found them out. Now, uh, and what we see then, uh, uh, after that period, we find a regular reference to this, to this lewd and promiscuous behavior by Iranians. And we know, we know Iranians are very lewd and lustful. So, Ulyarius mentions even, let's say, that in the Talish, in uh, in area in the Qizil Agaj, uh, Shah Abbas even wiped out an entire village uh, because of such lewd behavior. Uh, others mentioned the Ahla Haq who were uh, uh, involved in this. In this, uh, Sanson accused the Kizil Bash. You know, the, the Shah had a, had a lifeguard of Sufis, and he says that uh, they were held in great veneration, but at present, this is about 1690, are uh, in great disgrace, for they are uh, ex sensed of keeping no nocturnal assemblies which modesty does not permit me to explain. <laughs> and indeed, you know, when you look, let's say, at a few of the surviving uh, farmans uh, of uh, appointing khalifes, 
uh, for the uh, uh, the tribe, the, 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 the Sufi, uh, Safavid Sufi movement, which was organized by a tribe, then you see indeed at that time that in those, um, in those farmans, the shahs uh, instruct the khalifas to forbid the association with strange women beyond the permitted degrees and other such matters. Uh, very interesting is the Ottoman, the 17th century Ottoman traveler Evliya Celebi, who came in Iran twice uh, in the end of 1640 and uh, beginning in 1650. And, uh, but before he came to Iran, he writes, the Kurds did it as well, the bastards. And uh, they, um, he called them the accursed tribe of the candle extinguishers. Uh, he uses not, of course, Charakh Kushan, he used Mim Sundaran, which is the same thing in Turkish. And the Turks actually used uh, uh, the, the term Çırak Sundaran. Anyway, uh, uh, Celebi is a very interesting re uh, source because he really went out of his way to find the bastards. And he said, you know, look, I have been all over the place from, uh, uh, from uh, let's say, Iran, uh, Shirvan, uh, Dagestan, uh, Shamaki, Gilan, Baku, I visited Urmiye, Khoi, Maran, Tasuj, Tabriz, etc. I have been in the province of Sivas and the Sanjak of Kaskin, Bezuk, Sunkut, which is in Turkey. And, um, and I also, the perfidious people of the provinces of Rumelia and Silistre and the districts of Delyorman, Karasu, and Dobrucha, which is in Bulgaria, say that there are husbands and wives who are lovers of the, of the Shah, the Shah Sevan. Um, who are candle extinguishers and wear the Safavid Sufi hat. You see, there's proof. However, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, the same ex uh, excusation of, of Charakh Koshi is made for the Druze and Timani in Syria. It's interesting, the same Chalabi also says, now look, you know, I have been looking for this thing in all these places from Bulgaria to Iran, and I've never actually seen any proof of it. Which is really, it was rather, for an Orthodox Sunni like he was, uh, it was rather uh, an interesting uh, 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 acknowledgement. However, he didn't give up that easy. He also said, you know, well, where does it come from? Of course, from the bloody Iranians. Because Safiuddin, you know, the, who, who started the Safavid movement, uh, well, he was a holy man, he acknowledged that. He started the whole thing, he, men and women, were together, and at a mo certain moment he says, you know, the lights go out, take off your clothes, and then when the lights have come, find your own family. And lo and behold, it was a miracle. Everybody was with his own family. <laughs> Nothing. However, what happened after the Sheikh died, his Khalifes said, hey, we have to emulate our Sheikh. We do the same thing. And that's where it went wrong because they didn't, they didn't have his holiness and didn't, didn't know the difference between, between uh, family members and that's where everything, everything started. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, and let's say it, it goes on also in Turkey. He had a 19th century um, Turkish uh, author, Eshak Efendi, in his Kashif al Asra with the Afiyel Ashrar. He wrote about the Bektashi. He was not really, really, let's say, uh, well, okay, Bektashis were acceptable, uh, and they were not bad guys, but you had false <laughs> Bektashis, whom we called Hurufis. And uh, in fact, he, uh, he talks about the Bektashis of, uh, where was it again? In, um, well, I think it was in Saloniki. And there he gives a very nice, this long description of um, uh, how uh, bad these people behaved uh, with their own, um, own women. And uh, those who are married bring their wives and daughters to the meeting too. They drink and dance. And if one of them likes another wife's or daughter, he goes to the man and asks his permission to pick a, a rose from his garden. The man calls his wife and says to her, meet the demand of this beloved friend. Then he kisses her. If the demand is mutual, the two men go to the father and ask his permission. When the father gives his permission, they use each other's wives and daughters all through their lives. 
True Bektashis do not commit these vices. But it's true, they don't. Anyway, uh, similar accusations were also made to other sects in Iran. And, um, and you know, strange, it was not only Chalabi who initially believed that Chirag Koshi was a real thing. Europeans who reported on it, like uh, Kenir and, and Morier and Rollison, seemed to have believed it as well. And uh, uh, because they, uh, for example, Rollison wrote uh, that these orgies were certainly held until within the last half century, but not anymore. Um, <coughs> however, uh, uh, 20 years later, he wrote that he had a, uh, a vision and he said, no, actually, it's all make-believe. These things actually never happened and it is just, it is just a slander. Um, the, uh, you know, it also, uh, the, um, 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 the, uh, in Iraq, the same thing happened because the various um, heterodox groups in Iran, uh, in Iraq, uh, like the Shabak or the Qizilbash, had a ceremony during Ashura where uh, uh, all the lights were extinguished in the entire town or village and slippers are taken off and the entire night, I'm almost done, uh, in mourning. And um, they also were therefore accused of Chirag uh, uh, Koshi. The Yazidis were also accused of the same thing. Um, then, of course, if we go to the east, uh, because you know we were already in Bulgaria, in Kabul, uh, there were, uh, a, a, was a sect called Ali, uh, Ali Elahis, and they are called Sharaq Kosh. And there are various other uh, uh, groups that are, um, are, are um, uh, called that way. Uh, also, it's a very interesting, a group in the Hindu, in the uh, in, yeah, northwest province, the, the Chamkanis. They were originally Ali Ilahis who had fled Iran because of persecution, and they were everybody called them that Shirah Koshi. Interesting thing, at that time, they were Sunni, had become Sunnis, <laughs> but nevertheless, the label stuck. Uh, the the Babis, when they uh, made their appearance, um, were also uh, 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 accused um, of uh, Shirah Koshi because you know they were. Uh, they were in favor of holding everything in common property and practicing polyandry and what have you. Even, let's say, in Iran, the, the term basically dies out at the end of the century. You don't find any, at least I don't, I didn't find any mention of it. Uh, however, in Afghanistan, for example, uh, the, the, in, in, in the, the 1970s reported when Afghans drove through Hazara territory, they yelled out of the car, Chirakhosh, Chirakhosh! And even right now, if you go on the website, you find uh, chats uh, on the website of, uh, uh, of, of Afghans uh, who, um, um, for example, here uh, in two, May 2009, Kabulis urged the Panjiris to return from where they came because you introduced the culture of Charag Koshan, a nomadic unknown tribe, this is, this is a citation, from the other side of the Jaihun. You presented the family culture and family education of Rahim Panshiri and the Mas'ud families and tribes. I mean, all bad things. Anyway, what it shows, let's say, is that um, mankind needs labels in order to understand the world, and especially when there are groups whom you don't like for whatever reason, especially when they are religious, because uh, that instills in people uh, uh, the urge to find fault with other people and labels, especially when they are very slanderous and bad, uh, very much appeal to our basic nature. Thank you very much. Huh? Pictures? Thank you for that very interesting presentation. <laughs> Well, you know, I took, pic I took pictures, but then I forgot that it was dark, so it's nothing to see. <laughs> okay, thank you for that interesting presentation. Uh, I learned a lot. And now I'm going to introduce the last speaker. Um, Corey Miller attended Harvard uh, College, where he majored in linguistics and romance languages and completed his PhD in linguistics at the University of Pennsylvania 
writing a dissertation on uh, pronunciation uh, modeling and speech synthesis. In 2009, he came to the University of Maryland's Center for Advanced Study of Language, where he has been developing a Persian research program, including uh, lexical and dialect studies of Afghanistan and Iran. We look forward to your presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Hirad, um, for the introduction, and Kevin for the invitation, and my colleagues at the University of Maryland for providing a very rich environment in which to think about these things. Um, if I can open it. Um, actually, I just wanted to say before I get started, some of the, the themes that I am learning from the other papers uh, include the cosmopolitan nature of the Persian language. And I think that Pardis um, intimated that that has to do, if there's something, a linguistic element to that. And that would be the flexibility of the Persian language to absorb the vocabulary from Arabic, from Turkish, um, from other languages, from French and, and now English. Um, and if you think about like the verbal system and what we call light verb construction, something kardan, it's very easy to incorporate new vocabulary that way. In contrast, a language like Arabic or Hebrew, it's very difficult, you know, if you have telephone, you've got to make a new quadriliteral root out of it, and that's a little more acrobatics is required. So I think Semitic languages tend to be a little less uh, in inviting, to, and I think that, in addition to all the cultural factors, there's something linguistic there, perhaps. Uh, this paper is about standard national and colloquial varieties of Persian, and I wanted to thank uh, several of the research assistants uh, working at CASEL, uh, Evan, Jace, Tommy, uh, Rachel, and Mark, and also Alex Smalley, a former research assistant at CASEL, who uh, collaborated with me on some work I'll tell you about in a few minutes. So what I'd first like to think about is how to look at Persian, you know, there's a chronological dimension, and then there's a geographical dimension. And then in any given place, there's going to be a vertical dimension of all the different social classes. So language is always a moving target, and it is not uniform. So uh, one way to look at this, we could think of Persian, uh, three kinds of Persian. There's a literary language. And as Paradis mentioned, this is 1,000 years old, and it's you know, largely the same. We can pick up Ferdowsi and read it with a little help. Um, primarily in terms of vocabulary. Uh, and that is shared you know, among the different countries where Persian is spoken today, uh, in Iran and Afghanistan, and also Tajikistan, despite the alphabet problems. But I did speak to some of my colleagues who've been there, and apparently you, know, you can buy Ferdowsi and Hafez transliterated. And they also told me that some of these BBC Persian, BBC Tajik, a lot of those just transliterated. So, um, it really is the same on that level, except for the alphabet. But then, of course, each nation state has what we might call a standard language, a standard um, literary or uh, maybe national language. And so these tend to get labels. You know, in Farsi, of course, is a word that's shared among all the cultures. But just for simplicity's sake, we can refer to the Iranian var variety as Farsi and the Afghan variety as Dari, even though people there may say Farsi. And um, it was only since 1964 that that became an official term. And then the notion of Tajik, of course, has different meanings. You know, it could mean a Persian speaker in Afghanistan, or it could be a, you know, a resident of Tajikistan. But anyway, we can refer to that variety as Tajik. And as I'll show, each of these varieties has particular differences you know, at the written level. Uh, then we can talk about a colloquial language uh, that each, each country and each city, of course, has its own variety. And one thing that's important to note about Persian is that there's a, potentially a wider gulf between the written and the spoken language than you might find, say, in English. I mean, of course, it depends on social class and environment and things like that. Um, one term that's been offered is the term diglossia, which people use to describe Arabic, for example, where there's a modern standard Arabic based on the language of the Quran. And then each country from Morocco you know, all the way to Iraq has its own variety. And these varieties are not necessarily mutually intelligible. There's been some debate whether Persian is also diglossic. 
And some people say it is, and other people say it isn't, or it's not quite as extreme as the Arabic case. In any case, it's a continuum that we should be aware of. And one of the reasons that has been given for the fact that Persian is not diglossic is the plethora of terminology. So for example, in Arabic, there's one term, fusha, to refer to the standard, moder you know, whether it's modern standard or classical Arabic variety, it's fusha, and everything else you know, is some kind of colloquial variety. In Persian, there are several terms. So the standard variety we could call ketabi uh, or rasmi or adabi, and the spoken or colloquial variety we could call goftari, amiyane, mohaveri, and things like that. One thing, it's difficult to talk about spoken and written today because for at least 50 or maybe, uh, maybe 100 years, what, uh, written Persian can also include in dialogue you know, forms of the spoken speech. Uh, and also today, of course, we have blogs and things like that where people most often write in the colloquial language. So speaking about written and spoken uh, is a little bit of a misnomer. And also, you could deliver a lecture or a poetry reading and speak in the standard language. So I'll talk about standard versus colloquial just to have a slightly more anchored way of speaking about those notions. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about in this cosmopolitan nature of Iran and the fact that we have you know, three nation states today where it has an official role, uh, there is a lot of variation. And this would be at least at the, that standard, that middle level. Um, so you take a notion like bicycle, which is do charhe in Iran, or bicycle in Afghanistan, or velociped in Tajikistan. And that doesn't mean that do charcha and things like that don't exist. There is the shared vocabulary, depending on your exposure to education and media and so forth but I think these may be the most usual words for this concept. And also, in the phonological or phonetic domain, there are vast differences. I met that we were talking about uh, uh, in, um, uh, in Dr. Osman's talk about Beydil, you know, that could be Bidel, Beydil. I mean, it sounds like a different person uh, if you think about it in terms of pronunciation. But even New Year, no ruse in Iran, uh, now rose in Afghanistan, or Navruz in Tajikistan. So they're quite uh, broad differences. And also at the level of the morphology and syntax, if in, a, in a construction like he can eat, it could be mitune bohore in Iran, or horda metana in Afghanistan, or hurda metonad in, uh, in uh, Tajikistan. So there are differences in both the endings on verbs and in the order of the, of the elements of these constructions. There are also some interesting things that we could think about as reversals. So my colleague Mark was telling me that, you know, as we know in Iran, ve might be a more literary way of saying he or she, whereas u is a more normal way. In Tajik, it's the reverse, where u is the high register and vi is the more normal way of referring to he or she. And then in the semantic or meaning domain, in Iran, a da'i is a maternal uncle, um, whereas in Afghanistan, it's a mama, and then midwife is the reverse. So there are a few other examples, but I think the most blatant are when things are, are in, it, it reminded me a little, you know, you could say that's bad and mean good, you know. Uh, so as far as, yeah, I was mentioning before about the standard versus colloquial varieties and the names that are used, and we've talked about um, diglossia. These are the articles, um, if I, and I guess this will be preserved for eternity so people can look some of these things up if they like. And I wanted to think about what it means to be a standard language. And first, we can think about the United States or the United Kingdom or Canada. Um, what, is the what is standard American English? You know, people might say it's something that newscasters speak, but it's usually not associated with any particular place. Uh, when I was in high school and we went to Spain on an exchange program, they said, you're going to where they speak the best Spanish. And I don't know where they would send people you know, in America to where they speak the best English. Maybe Greenwich, Connecticut was what I was thinking. Um, uh, and then the same in the United Kingdom, there's a notion called received pronunciation, which is spoken throughout the United Kingdom by people in the upper or upper middle class, and usually when they go to boarding schools. And I was thinking about that too, the public schools in England are private schools. So that reminded me of the discussion that we had about Melati. Same in Canada, there's no one place, there's just kind of notions of what is standard. However, when we get to the domain of Iran or Afghanistan, well, 
well, where's the best, where, where is, what is standard Persian? Oh, it's Tehrani or something like that, or Kabuli in the case of Afghanistan. In the case of Tajikistan, the standard actually is supposed to have come from outside of the borders of Tajikistan, as, as was alluded to in the earlier talks in Bukhara and Samarkand, which are in uh, Uzbekistan. So what I wanted to explore is the relationship, primarily in the case of Iran, uh, with Tehrani and the Goftari, what is the difference there? So there is a grammar, a dasture, zabone, goftari, uh, by um, Kamyar, and it is a full book length description of the colloquial language and how it is spoken. And what it distinguishes in its preface is a differences between Tehrani and this, what he calls, goftari rasmi. So the notion is that there's some kind of national colloquial variety that's acceptable uh, in Iran. And that I think one thing we can think about when we talk about accent is it's the absence of accent that is sort of important. Because if somebody doesn't have an accent, then you'll pay attention to what they're saying rather than, rather than worrying about how they're saying it and trying to pigeonhole them. And I think that's what's important in terms of media and things like that. Um, so some of the differences that Kamyar provides in the case, so very commonly in Persian, of course, or in the Iranian Persian, uh, between khane and khune, that's a classic difference you know, between the uh, written language and the spoken language. But in this case, uh, Kamyar is saying that the formal spoken language can say umad, no one would raise an eyebrow, but it's to say umadesh and add that kind of pre prefix or suffix, raftesh, goftesh, things like that, that is not quite uh, part of this goftari uh, rasmi, and it might be more Tehrani, but that's not to say that it doesn't happen in other cities throughout Iran. And that's the other thing that one of the projects we've had at Castle at the University of Maryland is to explore the dialects of Iran. And one of the things we found was that a lot of these features, this happens in English too, so if you ask somebody from Pittsburgh, what's Pittsburghese? And they say, oh, we say gonna. Well, everyone in America says gonna. But there's other things like Ewans that they only say in Pittsburgh. So people are not necessarily aware of what distinguishes their variety from the others and might uh, you know, bring forward something that is, in fact, more general. In any case, uh, Kojahastan for Kushan, Kojahasti for Kushi, Kojost versus Kushesh. And another construction that some of my colleagues had, and I had first heard this in a movie, uh, Didatesh, something like that, for something like Dide Ura. And th these things are so, yeah, so it's, it's Tehrani, so it's not quite at this Goftari Rasmi. Ina Hashesh versus Injost, Una Hashesh versus Unjost. The use of Baraye for Vase, I guess that might be debatable. And Are versus Ari, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say Ari, so I don't really know to what extent. Um, it would require more research to just see, look into this. Uh, on ketab versus un yeki ketab, and chashma versus chash. There are a lot of phonetic variations that are probably admissible in this more national colloquial variety. Uh, this was also talked about in a series of books uh, by uh, Don Stilo and others, uh, where they introduced Persian first in its colloquial Iranian form in Romanization. And that could be a, a debate more in a pedagogical context of what the best way to learn. But they also introduced this concept where there's the standardized colloquial, and that's what they, they're going to teach. And then there are some extensions of it that are Tehrani. Um, that they, and they also introduced the term Chodemuni, uh, our own speech. And they say that it's not quite clear what's Chodemuni versus Tehrani, you know, maybe something that you would just say in your family context and not further. And, a lot of these things are similar to what we saw with Kamyar. Some of them are a little bit contradictory with what he was saying, but this extended on raising on to un. So even though there is, you do say hune in the standardized colloquial, to say terun, that's going a bit further, or irun. And then they distinguish, you know, zabun. Maybe you could say that about the physical tongue, but maybe not necessarily about the language. And I read somewhere, um, Little House on the Prairie was, you know, Khaneye Sefid, but your the house where you live was Hune because you heard it on TV. That's how they introduced the program. Or no, yeah, I guess that was the program. And then Esfahan, Esfahun. I guess there's some difference with proper names, Kermon, Kermun. I asked a guy named Kamran, could you be Kumrun? And he said, absolutely not. <laughs> so, um, uh, 
<laughs> then there's also vowel harmony, and I think uh, it was in the talk earlier by uh, Muriel where she mentioned that in the form of Uzbek spoken in a particular place, they got rid of vowel harmony, maybe by influence from Persian. But there is vowel harmony within Persian uh, in the colloquial or Tehrani variety. And I don't know if you would agree with some of these, but Bolus versus Bulus, Olum versus Ulum, Orupa, Urupa. So the vowel harmony just means you're getting a little more rhyme and the phonemes are copying each other. Hohuch, Huhuch, Horuf, Huruf, Folut, Fulut, Chocolat versus Chocolat, and so on. <laughs> and then in addition to the, there's harmony with E's as well and some what we call final devoicing. So a D becomes a T. So Kelid versus Kilit or Shevid, Shevid versus Shivit, Belit versus Bilit. And then there are some that you couldn't really write a rule for. Syllables might drop out. You know, gorosne becomes goshne. And this sinema versus sinama, um, I'm going to show you other evidence that perhaps sinama is not quite as marked as it seems here, or cheli versus chele. And then things like boskon versus vakon might be just another level of colloquial language. This is a book uh, that was written by uh, Lazar Pesikov in the Soviet Union in 1960 called the Tehran Dialect. It's actually very interesting because it's really the first book-length description of the Tehran Dialect and it treats it like a language. So there are verbal paradigms, you know, Beham, Behesh, so on, Vasemun, and they have, you know, or Migam, Migi, so on. Usually you, you, you would see in some of the other grammars like Lambton or Thaxton some little section on colloquial, you know, differences, but not necessarily treat them as a language of their own. Uh, Alex Smalley and I have begun translating this into English, and I think it will be interesting. And so part of this work that I'm talking to you about is from the introduction to that, because I was. Pesikov also wonders, you know, there's the Tehran dialect and then there's this colloquial variety and people really don't know what the difference is. And in the introduction, because anything can be translated in Iran, which is actually a good thing, I think, from a creative standpoint, I mean, we, were, we tried to contact the Russian publisher and so on and so forth. Uh, that wasn't too easy. Anyway, um, Shoja E wrote, is the translator of the Pesikov Tehran dialect into Persian. It's called Lahjeye Tehrani. And that came out in 2001. And in, in his introduction, he says, well, some of this stuff that Pesikov wrote, which is actually based on field work that Pesikov did in the 1940s, uh, is out of date. And he gives some, he calls that this old Tehrani. And Shoja E said, well, I grew up in a traditional neighborhood in Tehran, and I did some field work. Uh, in the annoying industries. I guess that must be metallurgy and things where people are blowing torches and stuff. And he met some traditional uh, speakers of these things. And he said, you know, so I think what Pesikov says is true, but we don't say it like that. And what he offered was hishke versus hichkas, or nonza versus nuzda, or bogu versus begu. Um, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, there was a spate of dissertations uh, that the sociolinguistic variety uh, that occurred in Iran. And I was talking to Ruzbe the other day, and he said, you know, this is a time when there were, you know, more Americans, and this was kind of the, all the rage in American sociolinguistics with William LeBov and others. And um, there was, these dissertations are very interesting. They're not as comprehensive as Pesikov. They don't look at the whole language. They just pick certain variables. And then they investigate them kind of vertically and say the upper class does this, the lower class does that, uh, women do this, men do that. Uh, some of the dissertations, like Zamir, he looks at the Armenians and the kind of Persian that they speak. Uh, and then he looks at the Jaheli and things like that. So there's a lot of very interesting sociolinguistic um, differentiation going on. <coughs> so it's some of the same variables we've seen. Um, you know, the aw versus the oo, um, some of the vowel harmony, uh, kuchek versus kuchik. This is something when I first learned Persian, you know, we had the Faxton book, it says kuchek, and other places say kuchak, and then the teacher says kuchik. Where did that come from? So it can be very disorienting for the student to kind of feel, figure out where these different varieties fit in. And, and a lot of these things can't be really derived by rule. Um, other things, you know, shohar versus shohar, uh, shuhar, um, then this nistim, nisim, lahje, laje, fek, fek. 
So all of these are sociolinguistic variables that could be investigated. And we do the same thing in English. We look at TD deletion, whether you say west side or west side. So a lot of these variables are actually cross-linguistic and interesting to study in any speech community. Uh, another area besides phonetics where you can see varieties, of course, the vocabulary. So uh, John Perry, in an article where he says Persian isn't really diglossic compared to Arabic, he says, well, there are some words such as slow in the standard language, we aheste, colloquially, yavosh, head is a sad or kale. You know, we can say things like noggin in English, you know, and the French have all kinds of things like this as well. Bini for nose versus damov. Um, there's three really good lexical resources. There's the Farhangi Farsiye Amiyane by Najafi. And he says, you know, this is mainly about the Tehrani vocabulary. Except I think Jamalzadeh came from somewhere else, but we'll let him include him anyway. And Samoyi wrote the Farhangi Logate Zabane Mahfi. I guess that. I guess that was one of the poets we heard about this morning. <laughs> um, in this case, it's kind of the argo spoken by the youth of Tehran. And then Ahmadi, I just picked this book up a couple weeks ago in Los Angeles, the Farhang, Farhange Baro Bache Haye Terun. And um, I'll show you a picture of that. It's a very interesting uh, picture. Uh, this is it, so you have a piece of lavash turning into, it's not matzah, that's Sang becoming, sangak. sangak, sorry, okay, <laughs> becoming white bread. The implication, I think that's what that is, but I, I think if you looked at the vocabulary that's in the book, it's not really anglicisms, but maybe it's just a kind of metaphor for um, youthful change. Uh, another source I wanted to show you, I guess I was inspired by the thousand years, and that's why I have these pretty pictures of books. <laughs> uh, this Farhenge uh, Alvaiye Farsi by Giti Dehim is a very interesting uh, book. It was inspired by a uh, French pronunciation dictionary by André Martinet and uh, Henriette Walter, uh, where they actually try to quantify these differences in pronunciation. So the word uh, Mujeb, maybe that's the minority pronunciation. Uh, I remember hearing some people say Mojeb, and here, the uh, Giti, uh, the she, her methodology was she said, well, who are we going to uh, investigate to figure out what is the pronunciation? And she said, well, Tehranis who are professors because that's the highest social class. <laughs> I wish, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, she restricted herself to Tehran, interviewed some people, uh, must, and then has you know thousands of words where she feels you know not ob even though that could be pronounced ow in Afghanistan, in Iran or in Tehran, it's not really a variable. So certain words like this one that could be, could be mojeb, perhaps on analogy with mored or something like that, mujeb or mojeb and things like that. And gives a number of how many informants said each one. So it's really an interesting resource for exploring okay, uh, pronunciation variation. Yeah, so that's really all I wanted to say. I really. I think there needs to be more research. I think it would be good to go to a place like Tehran and do a proper sociolinguistic study now in you know, 2014 or 15, whenever it's going to happen, to explore different social groups and explore you know, what's on the media. As you notice, if you listen to the BBC you know, over the past 10 or 20 years, it's changed. Everyone is not speaking received pronunciation. Some of the announcers are from Northern Ireland or Scotland, and that's OK the extent to which that's possible. And also in Afghanistan, you know, Farhadi wrote his book about the spoken Persian of Afghanistan, 1955, which is a long time ago. And the other thing I wanted to say about Afghanistan was a lot of the media reports were with, relating to this Pohan Tun Donishka debate are claiming that, you know, a lot of Afghans went to, t went to Iran during the you know, periods of upheaval and came back. So they've heard Tehran, Tehruni or whatever you want to call it. And, but there's a certain uh, stigma attached to using it in Afghanistan. You know, they have, this reminds me of the Cherog Kosh, they have sandwich eaters, you know, things like that. Yeah. <laughs> Latte, drinkers. Latte drinkers. Okay, so there's all <laughs> kinds of labels for these kind of uh, people. Um, but there are news reports also where I think there was some Afghan press that we were reading that something forbade the use of the lahjeye irani, 
you know, how do you forbid the use of an accent? But I think the term lache is a little broader than our term accent in English. It might not just be pronunciation, but I think there's probably some influence, whether it's from media or from emigres who are returning, uh, that might be changing things in, in Kabul as well. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. That was very, very fascinating. It was very useful for me, actually. Um, I would like to take questions. Uh, we have till 1 o'clock. And then after that, um, Kevin, it's your show. Uh, <laughs> you tell us what to do. So feel free to get up and ask questions from any of the panelists. And uh, they have uh, microphones there. I think they can speak into it. Go ahead. Ms. Fairman. Because when, for instance, Sultan Mahmoud Fateh conquers Istanbul, he, uh, he goes to the uh, ruined castle of Byzance, and uh, the emperor has fled. And he extemporarily uh, makes a poem, which comes out in Persian. And he says, have a himself, and Kabul, whom no buttons about that. Which he, he recites it. It seems that he was, uh, I mean, so fluent in Persian that it comes out like that. And the other point is that uh, you have to really bring in the Shubhi uh, movement because, after all, it wasn't, uh, I mean, like that, that the Iranians simply went along and simply try to oppose the Arabs by the, um, by the uh, language. Uh, there were quite a number of uh, poets, Iranian poets, who wrote in Arabic. For instance, Sa'alabi in Gati which is around Sultan uh, Mahmoud, mentions that Abu Nawaz, for instance, uh, or there is this other blind poet who was Persian. Uh, and he recites against the Arabs. And um, Salabi says that there were 330 uh, in Yatimata, uh, 330 Persian and uh, Arabic writer, uh, poets in, only in Khorasan. Uh, so it, it gradually becomes like that. It, it, it gradually it changes really. It wasn't uh, all, all that much. And one, uh, there are quite a number of other things I should mention, but uh, my, also, if I have a question, I don't know, what is your thought about uh, the development of Persian? For instance, we have the poetry of Rudaki, which is very easy for us. Um, almost you can say that Rudaki is well, is one of the first poets after Islam. But whereas Jami's poetry, which is uh, contemporary with Chaucer, uh, in English we have hard time to read Chaucer, Chaucer. whereas uh, Rudaki is very simple. Uh, what can you say about this kind of development? As it is, it has been almost static for that. Okay. Yeah, very good points. Thank you so much. Uh, about Abu Hanifa and Shoabir, I was only stating the different theories. So these are different theories in relation to the Persian language, whether this is a language of Islam or not. So I'm not going to go into the debates between the Persians and Arabs now, because that's in 15, 20 minutes, um, uh, we don't have time to go into that. But um, about Mehmet the Conqueror, the, um, apparently his first court language in Bursa when he took power before, uh, before uh, 
and uh, b before the uh, conquest of is Constantinople, uh, the first court language was Persian, and then he, you know, they changed it to oh, um, to Ottoman. So. Um, and I was just reading about it that apparently the Mehmet the Conqueror knew eight languages and Persian was one of them. So definitely, you know, in his course, uh, court, he was a patron of, of those, um, of, of Persian language and literature to a great extent. And about Rudaki, you, have to, you definitely have a point that, uh, that there is, you know, as, as we go along in the 1500s, uh, we get to closer to Sapke Hendi, you know, the, and, and the yeah, Indian uh, style becomes completely, com uh, you know, complex and difficult to read. And very flowery language with with uh, words that, uh, you, you know, nowadays uh, modern Persian speakers and uh, um, even educated modern Persian speakers are unable to to read and understand. Um, so there is uh, some, you know, some simplicity, if you want to call it simplicity, but in the Khorasani uh, um, style of, of early um, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, which, which gradually as we go along and as, as this region of this literary expanse, really um, this literary region expands, you see that it becomes more and more complicated. Um, I have a comment, actually, yeah, go ahead. about the conservatism of the Persian language, which I think you're alluding to, um, which is different from English. And one thing that occurs to me is the advent of modern English was supposed to have started with Shakespeare. And I don't know if you could say that things have slowed down since then, but I think the having a huge literature and an oral tradition of reciting poetry, I think that must have done something to preserve Persian in this one um, form, but at the same time, I'm sure there's always been colloquial languages that have been spoken and the varieties of which we couldn't, since it's not been recorded, we mm. won't really have access to. Although there are, uh, fortunately, some Europeans who went, you know, 600 years ago to the Persian-speaking regions and transcribed things into the Roman alphabet. So that's very helpful for us to figure out how things were spoken at the time and if there were deviations, you know, in grammar. So I was thinking the centrality of a literary and oral literary tradition probably assisted with that uh, conservative nature of Persian, in contrast to English. But I also wanted to add, uh, quickly take, that uh, Richard Fry, the late Richard Fry, also mm -hmm. had this uh, concept that he was encouraging that it was the Abbasids and the Arabs who really encouraged making Persian the lingua franca east of Baghdad mm -hmm. because they realized the eastern areas were not Arabic speaking and they themselves, Arabs, encouraged this new Persian that was written in Arabic script. So the Arabs had a role yeah. which Iranians conveniently like to forget. Um, so this is one thing. And then that's the in, in line with the first theory <laughs> that I was mentioning. There you go. So, and then the other thing I wanted to also add is what he was saying, that the uh, medieval Persian dialects, I think some of it has been well preserved in, among Persian Jewish communities. All the little, little Jewish uh, dialects that exist throughout Iran, Mashhad, etc., they have preserved some really old medieval Persian guyesh, guyesh ha in their form. Anyway, they're fine. Um, Dr. Miller, uh, it would be interesting to also look at the dynamics of how this evolved, uh, particularly in the contemporary setting. Like, you know, Shamlu, when he was trying to uh, translate some poetry from uh, uh, Spain, Lorca, you know, we don't mm -hmm. have a culture of uh, bullfighting in Iran. So he had to invent words mm -hmm. that, that, you know, uh, fit in his, his context. And then more recently, the underground music, mm -hmm. like uh, rapping, like this guy would say, cap hobby, uh, which I guess it means sleeping in the street. Mm -hmm. You could only understand, never heard that. So there, there, it's, it's constantly uh, evolving, and it's, it's an interesting dynamic process. Uh, Dr. Keshavars, go ahead. I just, a couple of very quick things. One is, wouldn't it be, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really speaking as a non-linguist, but it, it, isn't it that the language would be reflecting um, some of the social and cultural patterns, and so it could be concurrently serving Islam and opposing Islam, 
depending on where we are looking at it and how it's being used rather than being language being seen as an idiom of either of these two ideologies. Mm -hmm. so, that, that, so it it's more far more lived and historicized, and so in each context it could be seen. Absolutely. I mean, actually, John Perry talks about that, and he says that, mm -hmm. it, that, that language cannot be religious, so you cannot talk right. about uh, language in religious terms. Right. And, and, the, and the other thing is, um, and don't forget that I want what I wanted to say. <laughs> um, yeah, the difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a little bit hard for me to associate difficulty with sucking and eating. And I think that the uh, playfulness and the use of the language, the poetic language, in ways that is, of course, different and has its own signature. But um, so it may be, as opposed, for example, a language that borrows heavily from Arabic or some other or anything that's syntactically difficult. So I'm wondering if that is also very much relative to who we are talking to. Who is it difficult for, mm -hmm. and what period of time, and how, how is that? You know? Of course, not for a professor of Persian literature who has studied, you know, Sabki Hindi. So, 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 they're more familiar with the types of use of vocabulary. So I think we're using sucking and eating to different, in different ways. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Dr. Uh, Dr. Can we can distinguish between two sets of complexities. Mm -hmm. One is the semiotic complexity of the poetic language okay. between Udekia and Jomi. A lot happens there. Mm -hmm. And one is the language, it, the gradual entry of more and more Persian words from Arabic of course makes it more difficult for modern readers who are go doing the reverse, that is, reducing the Arabic yeah, okay. elements in Persian. As such, the key may appear mm. easier than Jami, but it's not. Go go to the Dekis Kasida on Bahar and you see every Qafiyah on, on, on the spring, every Qafiyah is very hard. Najib and Ajib and Mujib and so on and so forth. Whereas, you know, everybody refers to Guidri and That's very simple, of course. Mm. But, you know, I, I don't think... I, we can say that Udaki in general mm -hmm. is simpler than, than Jami, and we cannot say that this is a, an index of the complexity of language. It may be an index of the complexity of language. In this case, I'm convinced that the semiotic system is very thin. If you If you follow the imagery of Udaki, you come across time after time, just from, from sympathy to metaphor, and that's it. But by the time you come to Jami, you have this complex, Built up philosophical system that directs the language to, towards greater and greater complexity. It's not a regional thing. Saki and is a total misnomer. Okay. As is Saki Koran, Saki Arabi. These are temporal concepts, not regional concepts. Okay. We have to have a conference on that. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> he, he's been very patient, so go ahead. No, not, I, I just wanted to ask a question regarding one of the entries, the Da'in. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there is the word Da'in. Which, um, so are these the same words, or are they different? Are they, the roots are the same? Because Raya is more akin to what uh, a midwife might be. Oh, well, that doesn't mean midwife, but that doesn't mistake. Okay. Yeah. okay. But this, doesn't it mean mother also? Because Daik in Kurdish means mother. Sure, but, but, but not Daik, not the mother. Okay, okay. Not okay. Da, okay. Da, okay. Da, all, right. all right, go ahead. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, so very wonderful papers, and uh, I just wanted to second the, everything that was just said about Sophie and I think it's a, it's a completely useless category, um, but I'll leave that for another time. Uh, I have lots of questions, but I'll just stick to one, actually this is sort of a comment for Professor Miller, Professor Miller, that, you know, one doesn't have to, you know, straight looking for Europeans to, you know, to track these earlier idioms. Of Persian, there's scores of comparative dictionaries and you know works of comparative philology from the medieval and early modern period that track the very kind of phenomena that you are talking about in the 10th century, the 14th century, the 16th century. Um, 
And in, you know, in those in those contexts, the terminology would be slightly different. I mean, the you know linguistic variations or different kinds of usages or idioms would be described as pasado or pasado clock. Um, and there's a lot of sort of tracking of these kind of pasado clocks in these in these words, and also kind of sometimes hand wringing about it that the idiom is getting diluted or whatever. But the interesting thing is that, or one of the many interesting things is that, for instance, that from the very first some of the very first of these dictionaries, for instance, the Ram Sarhang, which is I think 10th, early 11th century, the issue is poetic intelligibility. So Gadran is writing in Tabriz, and he doesn't understand some of the poets who are writing in Bach. And so when Nafir Khushro comes back down, he, he brings it out and he says, hey, can you, you know, tell me what these words mean? Because I don't know how you guys talk over there in Bach. And Nafir Khushro makes fun of him in his about this. He says, you know, he knew Persian, but he wrote good poems, but he didn't know Persian that well. I mean, <laughs> you see this kind of um, this kind of dynamic is playing out already in the wider world of Persian. Well, I mean, a thousand years ago. So, uh, I guess I mean it's, it's it's more of a comment, but I mean, perhaps you know. No, I definitely would like to follow up with you and start looking at some of those sources. But one thing that occurs to me that you can do with poetry <coughs> is things like shir versus sheir. Um, you could see what were people were rhyming at different times, and yeah. if at certain times, you know, they were, if they start rhyming words like in those classes, then you can maybe assume that that's what the rest of the people were doing. Maybe the poets are a little bit more conservative, but I think maybe that's somewhat some of the kinds of things that are discussed in the sources you're talking Certainly about. Certainly, by the 16th, yeah. 17th, and 18th centuries, the sociologists who are working on these issues are concerned with exactly this kind of mm -hmm. morphology and how it changes, you know, the difference between urban speech and rural speech. There's a very sophisticated debate going on. Absolutely. Any questions further? Go ahead. I just had a quick comment about the Iran uh, number of different times in terms of Persian among Ottoman and, and so on and so forth. But I think we need to be careful about generalizing from what one Ottoman Sultan may have known or may not have known and uh, and so on and so forth. As larger question of the emergence of Ottoman Turkish as the uh, administrative and also increasingly the literary language of <coughs> from, the, from the early to mid 16th century onwards. And, and then from there on, the sense of Persian is rather different as opposed to from, uh, you know, much earlier. So we really need to basically be looking at those kinds of larger questions of the place of Persian in let's say, Anatolia and in the Balkans in pre-Ottoman times, which is a different story, in the early Ottoman times, and post, especially Magnus' conqueror, or Magnus II, and especially post 16th century, basically. And it, the, the whole thing is very different, but the larger story is the same, which is the emergence of Ottoman Turkish as the, not only the administrative, but also the literary in Franca for the Ottoman Empire as a whole, at which point Persian, retreats to the uh, level of the exemplary literary language of the past, more or less, and people lose interest in the 16th, 17th century Persian uh, poetry. That's just uh, but one question for comment. no, that's that's a very good point. I think that's uh, that requires really another conference and its own oh, yeah. too. Sure. <laughs> all the, the, of those, the, I mean, all of those topics are the, 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 those are very important comments, but. Uh, the, the, mm, um, but up to the 19th century, if a Persian, for instance, went to the Ottoman Empire, would they be able to uh, to communicate uh, no. with the? No. No way. You would have to find a Mevlevi Dervish or someone like that who was not Persian. Yeah. They were to copy and Persian poems or hang it off the wall. That's that's a different story. That's just basically that's uh, that's obviously a program of decoration and ornamentation and uh, and the And, and Professor Flora, I have a question for you. Uh, the, the whole concept of Chahar Koshan and the whole, uh, you've done a number of interesting books on sexuality and the Vajar and what have you periods in Iran. How uh, essentially the society, the way the image we have is very conservative. Now with the archives coming out with the Qajar uh, oral history projects and the women's what have you, it seems that it was um, 
they were a very uh, Shabs and Didar and very lively bunch. How, how would you sum up the Qajar experience as far as uh, how conservative really were they? <laughs> and how were they not conservative? Give us your, your opinion. I'm just curious. I think people are not conservative or progressive. They have conservative aspects or beliefs, or for certain beliefs and certain progressive beliefs that changes over time and by region and by community. Uh, I mean, uh, let's say, well, yes, I mean, if you take, let's say, and then you have to make a difference also between urban and non-urban, let's say, if you, in, in, even in urban areas, I mean, the, the quarters were really, each were separate units. They had even walls and gates that closed at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lutis of one fought with the others. Uh, and indeed, let's say, the idea that uh, they were all uh, faithful Muslims is bloody nonsense. I mean, uh, it was a rather, I would say, a dissolute society. <laughs> I mean, uh, every vice that you can think of, uh, and that, I mean, was engaged in, uh, and that didn't. And of course, it was most, mostly done behind closed doors. Closed doors. But you know, drunkenness is quite common in the streets. I mean, uh, and and as well as other things. So, I think let's say the, this idea of uh, the devout Muslim uh, who didn't uh, didn't speak evil, didn't think evil, and didn't act evil is bloody nonsense. They were human, damn it, <laughs> like everybody else, and and uh, so they had their urges, and uh, and of course, let's say. When you do history, you also have always have to ask yourself: Now, why the hell did the guy or gal write this at this time? What, whom, whom did he have an issue with? Because you know, um, we, when we write, um, we do so because of a reason. Huh? And even if you want to educate, <coughs> you have a message, and so we have to be careful with these things. So I would say, let's say. Uh, no, I think that, that, that this, this or, these orgies, no, it is bloody nonsense. I don't think nobody has ever found evidence. And it, it would also be, I think, n not possible within the society that that, that, that but, um, but uh, uh, all the other things, I mean, you should read my books on, se on sex, so incest occurred. It still occurs, by no. the way. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so, and, and so, let's say, I would say uh, Iranians, Iranians, or if you want to become Muslims, are as human as the rest of mankind. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yes, go ahead. Can I just say one thing? Sure. Absolutely, exactly what you said. I did bring this up because it is open the whole deal. If they, Feel. you know, their book that Masoud wrote, perhaps maybe after that one, that's very much in the aftermath of the 1979 revolution. Mm -hmm. It's like his way of saying, we do have something else besides religion, and that's so important to us. So, you know, and, and, and we've had it in the past too. So I'm always thinking that he should, that particular book should very much be read in that, in who he was responding to. Yes. Exactly. But that's also shared amongst a lot of Iranians. Of course, a lot of Iranians. I, I think what people should read is a wonderful book, actually two volumes, Didani Ha or Shini Dani Ha. It was uh, published in 1948. It was in, in the Iranian. I have bad memory for names. I can't remember his name. Anyway, uh, he went around Iran. Was it like a bloody European tourist? He went through Iran, and he. he he wrote uh, uh, what he saw, and it was quite eye-opening, I must say. <laughs> really interesting. Hey, the family. Uh, Last question. Go ahead. Regarding the uh, Arabic words and, and Farsi language or Persian, uh, if you see that if you take up those Arabic words from the standard, uh, standard Farsi, the Persian, uh, will anyone be able to communicate? Uh, what have you can't do it. Well, I mean, I've seen lists, you know, that say merci, say pas, you know, they offer replacements and things for words. And I think what's, what's interesting to me about 
this question is which word, I think, so merci is probably the more common way, and then c'est pas, or doru versus salon, and things like that. The more Farsi word, I guess, is a higher register and less natural. But maybe that wasn't always the case when Arabic words first came into the language. And I think it would be interesting to understand how the Arab, and I think that was discussed in an earlier presentation about, um, and I think if the Arabs actually promoted Persian being used, and, that, and then the absorb, absorbability of Persian, all these factors uh, wound up with Persian having a huge Arabic vocabulary component that I guess there have been different reactions to at different times. And so you could, some people have tried to count you know, the Arabic component in the Persian vocabulary. And I think, but that's going to depend on genre and all these different things. And, yeah. yeah, and if I may add, there are purist attempts. For instance, there is a professor in Iran, Professor Kazazi, who yeah, tries to yeah. talk entirely in, in a Persian yes, that yeah. is with, you know, complete, yes, it's coded. So a lot of Persians do not understand what he's talking about. And, um, and, and, uh, and I've listened to him sometimes, and uh, he does use Arabic. So there is, it's, it's almost impossible. It's to impossible. I mean, that's, to me, it's like t taking French out of English. Can you imagine that? <laughs> How much are you talking about? It's it's all. Answered your question. Yeah, well, of Arabic origin. It's of Arabic origin. Yeah, exactly. I don't have an issue with that. I mean, some some Iranians seem to have, but to me. But you you call it Arabic. By calling it Arabic, you may be unknowingly we we all say that we have an issue with it. Every Arabic word that has come into Persian is Persian. Yeah. That is it. So Oya is Persian, Mantare is Persian. I totally Every agree. word goes I totally Persian. agree. I remember the first time I came to uh, uh, Iraq, I wanted to go uh, to the toilet, so I asked for the Mustarah. It's Persified, it's Persified Arabic, if yeah. you like. It's Persianized Arabic. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. No, I, I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> this is not a debate. I, absol I absolutely hate these kinds of debates because to me, uh, culture mixes, everything mixes. They leave no word. Yeah, yeah. They leave no word. You can say Duluth, but you can say Aleki Duluth. Yeah, no, 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 In Arabic, it's kitab, it's katib, it's maktub, it's yaktub. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. There's a whole array. No, we have selected. We have selected. We have not taken the whole family, the whole tribal words. We have taken them over the centuries as needed. And thereby enriching our language. Exactly. So, anyway, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Kevin, it's your show now. Uh, take over, tell us what to do. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.